Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 134 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am your host, Pervez Ahmed, and I am joined by the podcast co-host, Omar Ansari. Hey, assalamu alaikum, <laughs> Pervez, and assalamu alaikum, listeners. We are here at beautiful yeah, Stanford University. Yep, yep. recording at Stanford in Palo Alto, California. A really, really nice campus for those yeah. who haven't checked it out. Um, it's really beautiful. That's right. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, you know, uh, you, you, I didn't, I don't want to bury the lead. So why don't you go ahead and uh, tell our listeners who our esteemed uh, guest is for absolutely. today? Absolutely, we're here at Stanford for a reason, and uh, that's because we have Adnan Zulfikar on the show. He's associate professor of law at Rutgers Law School, where he teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, and Islamic law. He's currently a faculty fellow at Stanford University's Humanities Center, which is where we are right now. He works in the fields of law, history, and religion, where his research seeks to critically examine the frameworks underlying legal discourses in both domestic and global contexts in the present and pre-modern period. His most re recent work centers on studying how Muslim jurists conceive of and utilize legal obligations, particularly in the context of revolution and war, rethinking approaches to the diffusion of human rights norms, and exploring questions relating to pol policing in the U.S. His scholarship has appeared in a number of academic publications. Prior to joining Rutgers, uh, Adnan was fellow at the University of Penn Law School, a Harry F. Guggenheim fellow, and a CASA fellow in Damascus, Syria. Uh, as an international legal advisor to the UNDP and IDLO, he helped draft and implement new criminal codes and commentaries for the Republic of the Maldives and the Federal Republic of Somalia. Adnan earned his JD uh, in law, MA and PhD in near, near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from the University of Pennsylvania, his MLS, International Affairs from Georgetown, and a BA, Religion and Anthropology from Emory University. Additionally, he spent a number of years studying languages, Arabic, Urdu, and Farsi, and Islamic sciences overseas, primarily in Syria and Pakistan, but with shorter periods in Yemen, Jordan, and Morocco. So welcome, Adnan. Uh, very, very impressive bio. We are super interested in diving in deeper. I can't wait. Thank you so much, Bismillah. It's a pleasure being here. And yeah, um, yeah the the bio is, uh, when whenever it's read, I always think my parents are thinking, yeah, you were just avoiding the real world for a really long time. <laughs> like, just, oh, I want to go study this. I want to study that. Uh, I think if, if they had their way, maybe not now, but back in the day, they would have just loved a doc, uh, uh, a bio that says, yeah, and then he went to medical school and became a doctor. So. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I, I want to also um, take this opportunity. Uh, I imagine he will listen to this show. It is a mutual friend. Well, your relative, a mutual friend of mine and Omar's, Noman Azur, uh, your cousin, who helped sort of introduce us and put this together. Uh, Adnan, you've been on my radar for the longest time as a kind of a wish list, you know, guest for the show. And unbeknownst to me, someone who I am you know, pretty close to right here in the Bay Area, Noman happened to be your cousin. So we, we you know, it was, it was great for Noman to introduce us and kind of serendipitous how all that happened. But, uh, and here we are in, in Stanford recording in Palo Alto. Yeah. And, you know, if a couple years back, if you, I'm an East Coast guy. So right. <laughs> if you had told me we'd be at Stanford recording, I'd been like, ah, oh, probably not recording me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this ended up being yeah. a pretty cool adventure. And, yeah. uh, uh, it's been nice to be, I mean, on this campus, you know, it's it's pros and cons yeah. uh, like any other place. But, you know, just being in the Bay Area, getting a sense of this coast, uh, yeah. kind of Muslim life here and life in general here. And, you know, I, I brought my family over, so I, I felt very immersed uh, in the place as opposed to kind of just... And you've been here how long now? Just a year. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. we got mm -hmm. here summer 2022. And right. We, we Didn't you drive cross country? We drove across yeah. country. Yeah, First time? Man. First time. And yeah. honestly, I, I highly recommend it. Yeah, for um, sure. It's, we did it in about eight days. Nice. Um, maybe about six hours of driving a day or so. And for those folks who have fourth graders, um, <laughs> fourth graders in their summer before fourth grade through the summer after, get into national parks for free them and their oh, families really yeah so uh -huh. i had a fourth grader and we basically visited a bunch of natural uh, uh, national parks right throughout sort of south dakota utah like moving through uh various places and it was yeah. it was awesome it was really sort of it, it was a part of america you know growing up east coast or in and around cities being in philadelphia for the last you know some 
on and off for about 20 years. You get out and you just see a different part of America, a different experience. And then just spiritually, I think, yeah. incredibly moving because you, you sort of recognize the tininess uh, of, of yourself and, right. and even just your experience here when you're out in like the canyon lands and just looking across yeah. this landscape yeah. that's been there forever you know? <laughs> uh, so anyway it, it's pretty cool and i definitely recommend it and also great from the standpoint of just family and yeah sure you have your frictions or whatever but just the the ability to yeah. you know bond and build these memories uh which they'll always be able to talk about all oh, that time we drove across the country so mm -hmm. did you go full rv or no 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 man okay, minivan okay, minivan yeah okay. yeah we thought about rv for yeah. a bit yeah but uh the minivan just seemed like a i always feel like route. the I mean, it's, yeah. it's no, it's no, I mean, yeah. our listeners aren't looking at you right now, but, yeah. but you know, you are, you hail from Indi India, India, Pakistan, the yeah. subcontinent. I always think of our being as the, probably one of the most quintessentially non daisy things you could do. Yeah. Although you would think just in theory though, yeah. you know, go picnicking and, you know, being able to cook on the road would be such a daisy thing. But yet I don't know of many, at least just yeah. in my social circle of folks I mean, who pulled so, it off. So it happens a little bit on okay. the East coast. Okay. Um, there you go. Not a ton, but I think, I mean, we looked into it. The whole process was so, it, it, it was so involved or felt so involved. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, renting it and then, all right, we got to only stay at RV parks. Right. And then what if you wanted to go into town to like get something? Like, where are you going to park your car? Like yeah. all these like little yeah. things. And then when you're making a cross country move, that just feels like the last thing you want to do is add more to your plate yeah. and figuring out like the kind of RV situation. Yeah, yeah. But I've honestly, my parents, my father was he really wanted to do that at one stage yeah. uh, as well. We just, we never did it. See, but um, it's yeah. just, I think, I think the thing would be, and this probably happens in most folks from like immigrant backgrounds. Once one family member takes the leap mm -hmm. after that, like <laughs> it just opens the doors. Opens the doors but yeah. since no one has done that in my family, as far as I know, yeah, it just yeah, never. Same. No, no, because I, like, growing up, my dad was very much, uh, my, like my parents, I should say, were very much about road trips. So on a whim, we would, and he had a company car that was paid for and, you know, he had, he had an expense account that you could, you know, yeah. pay, you know, and the gas was very much south of a dollar per gallon. Mm -hmm. So back in those days, and we would just gas up the uh, station wagon and, you know, on a whim, like from New Orleans or Houston, we would go to like the East Coast, we would go to the Midwest yeah. numerous times just for the yeah. weekend, a couple of days here and there. So I grew up a lot in that kind of milieu um but we never did the rv thing yeah so yeah, that's why yeah. i kind of bring it up i know you you guys went on road trips too right Omar? yeah but i'm like after about three hours three to four hours in a car i'm like okay i'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm done la is my limit from yeah. from, from california but, <laughs> yeah. but that's the uh, other thing i think living and having lived on the east coast is that because because you can cover so much or again you're yeah. obviously the mileage is the same or whatever, yeah. but you're covering like four states within right, right. a five hour drive, right. let's say, or a six hour drive. You just get to be out there more than yeah, I think I did, living on the West Coast. Yeah, although it's funny because I was telling someone the drive across country, there are portions of it where you're driving for ages. It's so beautiful. Yeah that it feels much easier than kind of that Philly to DC trip on 95, <laughs> which is just like, it's just like a terrible trip, right? Yeah. There's not, nothing to see except for other traffic. You know, 95 <laughs> is not the most sort of welcoming type of yeah. highway. So, you know, that was a nice thing. The one thing I will say though, is with the RV, the, the other thing that came up, which, you know, um, when we were driving across country, we were like, all right, I'm like, there are certain parts of the country I'm familiar with, I know. There are other parts I don't. Yeah. And we're in kind of a weird moment as a country, mm -hmm. a, a polarized moment. My wife wears a jab. I was like, you know, so yeah. at at a certain point, there was also, there was points where we talked about, like, are we going to stop in this place? We talked about the whole idea, you know, back in the day in the black community, there'd be the green book, which would, which would tell you, hey, these are kind of the places where yeah. for black folk, this is where you can stop. This is where you can eat. This is where you can stay. And we, I was like telling friends, I was like, man, I kind of wish I had a green book because I'm going into the unknown here in some respects. I mean, everything turned out great. We had no issues at all. But, you know, when you're venturing out and you're kind of trying to figure out, all right, like the only things I know about this particular place is kind of the news report about some type of like friction yeah, yeah. or polarized situation there and it's like ah i can handle it but 
I also don't want my ki- anything to mm-hmm. mark my kids' experience, right? Yeah. That like there's some racial or racist incident that occurs, and like yeah. now that's part of their experience. So good point. Um, yeah. Anyway, so it was just. Yeah. That's a good point. No, no. And yeah. thank you for taking a chapter out of uh, black history to kind of uh, situate where we are. Yeah, you mentioned your parents. Yeah. yeah that's yeah, always that's a definitely... good place to start. So exactly. that, your parents are from... Yeah, they're uh, from in... Pakistan. Pakistan. Yeah, okay. both of them from Pakistan, uh, from Punjab, from Lahore. They sort of... My father came over to get his... He got a scholarship to get an MBA. Uh, so he was... Uh, he got his MBA um, in Harvard and Cambridge back in the 70s and then ended up he was supposed to go back and you know that sort of immigrant myth uh, return myth of return yeah. yeah but but his was real he was really looking and his story is funny because he he's one time kind of as I understand the story I'm sure he, he'll correct it but he was like you know he says he he's on this campus it's it's you know Cambridge or Boston area in the mid 70s there's a ton of stuff happening in the country. But he was like, you know, I kind of felt like an alien here. Like I was just here. I went to my classes and then I kind of would would go home or like maybe hang out with some other like Indian or Pakistanis. Yeah. Like because this was totally new. It was a different experience for me. He, he wasn't, you know, well traveled or anything like that. And so he ended up though one day he uh, saw a bunch of people going somewhere and and they were going, there was like a talk that uh, some representative from the World Bank was giving. And so he just like decided to like, he didn't have anything else to do. So he like popped in there and attended the talk. And then afterwards there was a sign up sheet. And so he put his name down and he was the only one who thought to put his phone number down too. So he got a call from the bank and, you know, eventually they like, he interviewed and then he yeah. spent the rest of his career with the World Bank. Wow. Um, and okay. uh, But as a result of that, it actually, it's funny because, you know, over the years we, we you know, I've, I've been critical of the bank and mm. he's actually uh, uh, oftentimes given me the reading material of like the bank's biggest critics so that I can have like a good, strong argument, uh, even though he'll argue back. Um, but uh, it also is the reason that I, I kind of, he sure. made sure to uh, take us overseas and we spent you know, grew up overseas for different periods of time, uh, yeah. keen on us not just having the American experience. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and my mom, they got married, uh, I think a couple years or a year or so after he graduated. And then... So what, yeah. the, in terms of, obviously, you're an Islamic scholar now, mm-hmm. and how did that kind of, was that something that was part of the family from a very young age or... Uh, no, I, so the funny thing is, I mean, Islam, for my dad, like my parents, both religious, um, you know, in, in kind of the, uh, the way that you see in Pakistan, there was a certain period of time where there was kind of it, within the, if you want to say elite right. or educated society, there was kind of this division that happened. Yes. And this is speaking in broad generalizations between like folks who went with more kind of the communist socialist route, right? Who sort of Fez Ahmed Fez and like other, you know, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, others who sort of influenced. And in that time period, you know, there was a huge influence from Russia and all coming in. And then others who sort of got uh, attracted by Jamaat Islami and the notions of an Islamic revolution or whatever else, right? And you saw this play out on Pakistani campuses, right? To the point where you had like students engaged in full out battles with each other yeah. over student government, et cetera, as though they were fighting for the soul of the nation. And my dad, he, he never became hardcore Jamaat Islami, uh, but because in his circles, you know, and in our family, religion was, you know, was still very important. He ended up, you know, just, it was one of Maududi Saab and others were people who, you know, he would read and, and, and the idea, because communism at that period was kind of especially resistant to the idea of a place for religion, yeah. it kind of, for my dad, that wasn't even an option. And so so from that standpoint, yes, religious, all that. But the notion of me, you know, studying Islam as like a career, that took a while for <sighs> that to kind of settle in and, 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 and get established. Although there's a whole full circle moment because... Uh, my grandfather, so my paternal grandfather, uh, was uh, 
you know, he was a civil servant his entire career, but deeply interested in religion. So would go to darses all the time of Amin S. and Islahi, mm. and then later on others like Javed Ramdi, Maududi Saab, all that. And it, you know, he had that kind of drive and, and that interest in religion, et cetera, to a level, a scholarly level. Yeah, that's right. And it was like years later where, uh, you know, I end up kind of after my grandfather had passed, you know, after the point where I could have had all these conversations that I end up kind of in those same type of circles and right. and maybe, you know, at a different level now where I'm like trying to acquire the, the, the tools and the skills and the language uh, to be able to engage in these things on my own as well and, and right. kind of make a contribution. So, yeah, it's kind of funny how it works. They they, they would have loved, I was telling you guys, you know, they would have loved that if my bio was just, you know, you're a doctor. But I think now they've they've settled and they, they kind of appreciate it. And, um, you know, they, they attended my dissertation defense and my mom was just like, wow, I, I didn't know you had that much stuff in your head. Um, <laughs> and so it was, I think that was kind That's of a great. moment where they realized, oh, wow, he's... he's so so were you time. born in the United States? Yeah, born, okay, born okay. in Virginia. Virginia, okay. And yeah. then so you spent a lot of your early years in, in the DMV area? Yeah, I, so uh, when I was about three years old, okay. we moved to Kenya. Got it. So I lived in Kenya for about five years, mm -hmm. came back when I was around eight, again, to the DMV. We lived there for another five years or so, and then... Uh, moved to Malawi in Southern Africa. And then we were there. My family was there about six years. I was there about three or so. And then I ended up doing my last two years of high school uh, in New Hampshire at a boarding school. Boarding school. Um, but Malawi is like one of the most poor countries in the world, right? Yeah, so what was that like? About third poorest. It, it was the greatest experience of my life. Really? Like transformative in a oh. way that, you know, funny story is like when we were moving, I was, you know, middle of seventh grade, you know, middle of eighth grade, yeah. December of eighth grade. I was devastated. Like, of course, you know, that's a rough age. It's a to rough age. Move. My friends, yeah. everything, my social circles. And they were just like plucking me. I remember when my dad said, we're moving to Malawi. I thought he was joking. I'd never heard of the country. And he said, oh, the capital's long way. And I was like, okay, this is real funny. Like, come on. Like, and I thought he was, there's an old Desi song, Long Gavacha. Ajay. And like I thought he was like like just mixing things up there, the the uh, the currency was the kwacha, you know. There was just like all this <laughs> stuff where I was like, "This is a joke." And then he made me look it up, you know, in on like a globe or something. And I was I was like, "Wow!" And it hit me. And yeah, it's a tiny country, um, you know, probably about thirty percent Muslim, seventy uh, percent Christian. Um, you know, has a decent sized Memon community. Um, and you know, not too many Lebanese at that yeah. stage, but it was just, it was another world, man. Yeah. And, but we move, I'm talking, there's no TV, there are no malls, there's a handful of restaurants, max, there's no movie cinemas, there's nothing. Right. Wow. And you move and we're just like, you're an American kid coming from, you know, Virginia, like the er suburbs of DC. Early yeah. to mid nineties. Yeah. Early nineties. Yeah. Right. It's like 91. And it was just, it, it was intense and crazy. But what happened is, one, we get there and, you know, you, you start making some friendships. There were some American kids, others who had gone there. There were some other. And then you're starting to do things where it's like, all right, yeah, I can't sit and watch TV. So we're going to go take our bikes and we're riding through the bush. Like, and we're, we're, we're like going on these crazy adventures in the middle of nowhere, right? It's a very safe country, so we weren't really, parents weren't worried about that. You're like, you know, you're just, you're finding ways. Basketball became a big thing. I mean, I'd always loved it, but over there it was, you know, that was our way we bonded. And, you know, we we had, we had eventually formed this high school team, but there weren't a lot of high school competitors. So we were playing against other colleges and these grown men and we'd have like tournaments and, you know, so, but it was just, it was a very rich experience. And aside from that, it was transformative because, you know, when you go and you see poverty like that and you see sort of the fact that, you know, I, I remember there was a masjid that was 20 minutes behind our house walk. And my mom one time would regularly, but one time asked me to take bread and milk packets 
because uh, you know, and and go to the masjid for isha. Mm. When I say masjid, I'm talking about a, mu- a a structure built out of mud and straw, two rooms, mm. right? There's a candle at the front, and that's it. That's the only light. The azan is said right outside the door. The ceiling is like just a little bit, you know, maybe about six, maybe seven feet, right? The azan is said right outside. Wudu is done. People go <coughs> down the way to the river, get buckets, bring it for whoever needs That's wudu, amazing. right? Yeah. People who are coming there for Isha have been laboring all day, have been doing a whole bunch of things. And then there'd be little kids who'd come too. And I'm telling you, like I went and my mom would send stuff all the time. But this time I went and, you know, you distribute the milk packets and bread after you pray and, and just kind of sit in community. But like I have traveled all over the world. I prayed in ev- like the major masjids in the world. There is no salat of mine that has been as powerful, had as much khushu yeah. as the one in that masjid. Like it was just another level and because you, you're there and you're like, man, like these folks have such devotion and such like hope and love yeah. for Allah Ta'ala. And they're showing up there, you know, you, after, after Fatiha finishes, like everyone say, Amin, and the little kids, I can still hear, they extend it, right? So they, it would be like, Amin, ah, and you, it would, the ah was just these like little voices. And it was the most beautiful thing ever, man. And you just got real perspective where you were like, everyone there, no one was like down and out about their situation. People were just warm, friendly. They're trying, they're struggling, but, you know, happy about whatever blessings they had in life. And it just, for a kid, I was like, you know, I was 13, 14, 15. Man, that's transformative. You're coming from a space where like, Every day we were, you know, you'd be at school talking about like, oh, what what shoes do you have? Or like, what do you have this? What do you have that? Now I'm in this space where I'm like, man, like, I don't need all that. Like, you know, it was just, it was a powerful experience. And my my dad took me, I begged him to take me about a year after um, we had moved to take me back for a visit. And he agreed. And I remember when we we had finished up the visit, I had met all my friends back in Virginia and we were walking back to catch a cab for the airport. I'm I'm on the streets of DC and I'm just like bawling. And it was cause I was just, I just thanked my dad. I was like, I like, I like, I'm sorry that I gave you so much grief, but thank you so much. Like you changed my life Mm. because I had met up with my friends and they were having the same conversations. Mm from a year prior. Whereas like my world was so much richer. Mm -hmm. Like my stories were so much richer. And I just realized like, I was like, man, I love my friends there, but like my life had changed and it was only for the better. Mm. Uh, Which in in sort of, in some respects is why I I also chose to move my whole family to the West Coast. Yeah, you you kind of mentioned that. I I know the last time we met as a, as an American living overseas, I mean, and Omar and I come from families where we've experienced a little bit of that in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. You're you're kind of in a cuckoo, in a sense. You're there's a there's a tendency where you can just kind of live in an isolated bubble or cocoon of people who are fellow expats like yeah, yourself, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, going to private these elite private schools that you know. Yeah. And so, how how was that experience? Yeah, I mean, so you definitely have that have as that. well, right? Um, so you have to was, venture beyond your sort of comfort zone, or was it? It was it was a mix, right? Okay. It was like so you you engage with the folks, the expats, the kind of wealthier Malawians, the wealthier Malaw- Indian Malawians, like who are in your school. You definitely engage with them too, and but you know you're also participating in sports, so you're playing yeah. teams from you know who are coming from schools of different kind of socioeconomic levels. But then yeah, you venture. I mean, part of that. I always tell people, like, my mother, in some respects, is my, like, Sufi Sheikh, if you will, right? Or Sheikha. Like, because she was the one who really was, like, hey, you know, random Saturday, we got a truck, we filled it up with food, like, maize flour and all, yeah. and chichenges, which are kind of these wraps that women wear. 
and like we're you're coming with me we're going to make distributions in these villages and it was just like all right and so then and there then you're engaged and you're on the yeah. ground and, yeah yeah and you're sort of you know you're just talking to folks and then you know there's household help you're engaged with yeah. and you build true like real friendships with as as kind of a part of your family yeah in this weird and and wonderful way um so all of that was there and you know but you had to venture out yeah, and, yeah. and and so we did as much as we could you know mm -hmm. uh and we st it, uh, you know, it wasn't on my bio, but uh, my sister and I, we actually, have, we run a small humanitarian organization in Malawi called Banja Modzi. We've run it for since about 2005. And we basically do uh, flood relief, drought relief work. We go into villages with like uh, relief aid, food, etc. Sure. We build houses in those villages. We we do orphan care. We we're putting some uh, orphan girls through college right now. Yeah. We do like primary, secondary school education. That's amazing. Build That's water awesome. wells. Mm -hmm. so we, we just are starting our, I think, ninth water well now. You know, but all of that is because, in many respects, this kind of legacy, right? Uh, or you know, of lessons from our mom, from from even from my father as well. Who, you know, despite being with the bank, like his passion was like, you know, like no, we we have to. We have to help countries develop. We have to make, and his perspective was always like, what what matters for the people who are at the lowest level in society right. in terms of economics, right? Like, what what's going to matter for them? Like, the, what's the nuts and bolts of that? They care about food, shelter, security, these type of things, and so it just, you know, the, and that kind of has fueled a bit of this uh, NGO, which the work that you do, yeah, yeah no, mashallah, definitely. So, do do you end up? finishing high school there no so okay. i did um i did my o levels oh which, right uh was, european was british education british or they were gcse's at that st yeah. uh, stage so they'd move past the o levels and then yeah i had a choice i could have gone to pakistan uh, which i resisted fully um could have gone to south africa the uk or the u.s yeah. and uh because i imagined that i was going to go to college in the u.s i just thought it would be a better Thing. And my dad eventually, uh, we applied to a bunch of places and, you know, Hamza had options. And so, uh, you know, he agreed. And so I ended up yeah, at a boarding school in Exeter, New Hampshire. Oh, oh he went to Exeter. Okay. Uh, yeah, Phillips yeah. Exeter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. that's a very nice school, yeah. uh, certainly. And uh, certainly hobnobbing with the elites. <laughs> yeah. Although <laughs> funny thing Exeter, is, like, no? uh, yeah, so you do, but yeah. it's a, it, there are different cultures there. Okay. like almost 50% of the school is on scholarship. And so, really, yeah. I didn't know that. And so, okay. like, you have like all those elites, yeah. but you, you kind of engage them, you know, if they're in your friend circles. But like, most of my friends from Exeter come from, you know, pretty like standard backgrounds, if not, you know, um, like my closest friend from Exeter or one of my closest friends from Exeter comes from like the roughest yeah. neighborhood in Philly, right? Um, and in Strawberry Mansion, and you know, and I, I still remember, I did my college tours by myself. My family was in still uh, overseas, overseas. So I would just be on a Greyhound bus, just going everywhere. Yeah, and uh, so I, I, and I'd like show up this like little guy, you know, at these tours is hilarious but i remember stopping in philly i'd wanted to look at like haverford or something and so i stayed at my friend james's place uh but when he picked me up from 30th street station we got on a bus and all he said to me the whole ride was at the start he was like man just just watch how the scenery changes and it was it was crazy you know you just sort of go from the city and you get deeper into strawberry mansions and you sort of see kind of you know houses that haven't like basically parts of the city that just have been neglected and then you see schools with like you know that have like bars on the windows and yeah. other things and, and 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 you just start thinking like man like what's what's that doing to the psyche of the kid who's growing up in that neighborhood and who's seeing these things and, and and you know you just and then but i you know i stayed with him and his grandma and like a tiny little house uh but it was like awesome man they were like so much love and i love the neighborhood as well and um so we i know one of the things we were talking about off air uh, on the mic was getting kids outside of their comfort zone just i mean from the vantage point of now that we're parents but how that experience for you being probably away from home for the first time in high school right you're you're yeah. at high school you're a junior in high school right because yeah. you're finishing up high school at exeter 
very similar to my brother's experiences mm-hmm. because my parents were overseas, similar. They went to private schools, boarding schools in the East Coast. But what were your parents thinking? Like, I mean, you know, th- there's a certain level of trust that they have sending you away, but that newfound kind of freedom and, you know, where are you at, you know, in terms no, of... No, I mean, so it's funny because... Your um, own kind of religious, right? Uh, like, yeah. uh, um, centering. So it was funny because my... Um, my parents now, when they think about it, they're like, oh, my goodness, like, what were we doing? Like, you know, they're yeah. like, because it, it wasn't, man, I was literally, I was like, I went there when I was, you know, 15 or so, like 15, 16. So I'm I'm traveling back to Malawi like twice a year. Twice a year. Yeah. Right? Maybe three times sometimes. Mm-hmm. By myself, right? And like Malawi, it's not like regular flights. I would literally, I would get on a plane from Boston to Amsterdam, yeah. and I would be in Amsterdam airport by myself for 14 hours, yeah. and then I'd have to catch the plane to Malawi. And I'm just thinking, like, if, if like, let's say I just missed it, or, like, yeah. it's not like I had a cell phone to be like, hey, guys, like, let me just so WhatsApp true. you yeah, yeah, and yeah. let you know, right? <laughs> I mean, so it was just true. like such a... And, and I remember, I'm like, I would go there, I, I would, I'd bring my basketball, I would dribble a basketball in Amsterdam airport for like hours, <laughs> just like everywhere, here and there. Yeah. And and this is also a time period, you know, people don't realize like that time period, it wasn't as intense as maybe post 9-11, where it was intense for everybody. But for a lot of folks, it was still intense, right? I mean, I got grilled. Mm-hmm. I got grilled. I used to get, I, I remember one time undercover officers like, push me up against a wall in Amsterdam. I'm a little kid, man. Like, and they're like at demanding my boarding pass, et cetera. I'm like pulling it out. And as soon as they heard me speak American English, they kind of chilled out and, and clearly like the privileging my sort of, oh, he must have a blue passport and eventually let me go. But like, I, I mean, I, I still, I wrote about this in I think my college essays. I remember being uh, getting on the plane to Malawi in Amsterdam and the customs folks who were checking asked me, they're like, look at my passport. And they're like, I just have, you know, one last question. It's like, all right. And they'd been grilling me. And they're like, why do you have a South Asian? Uh, why, why, are you, why do you have Pakistani heritage, have an Arabic name, have American citizenship, but live in Africa? And I was like, li- I was just like, I don't know. You got to ask my parents. Like yeah. That, yeah. those aren't decisions really that I made, right? I mean, but it was you know that kind of scrutiny, that type of um, stuff was happening. But yeah, so it was intense. And, and my grandmother, my like paternal uh, grandmother, was really like upset at my father for <laughs> sending yeah, you and away. And he said, you yeah. know, she would say like "harabo you know, like he'll be spoiled. Um, and what she meant was religiously. Of course, the concern was that. You know, he's going to go and he's just, he's going to forget about everything. But, you know, I think as parents, and what one hopes is that you have built enough of a relationship with your children where two things happen. One is that they have a organic foundational sense of the faith, right? And it means something to them, right? And then in addition to that, the second thing is that if they if mistakes happen, they don't feel as though they can't turn to you at all. And you, you, you know, just nailed and, it. and it's yeah. not like I think turning to my father would have been tough, but I oh I feel like an, I could always turn to my mom, right? Mm-hmm. And even my dad, you know, once he got over things, yeah. he'd be fine. Or having uh, the buffer of your mom, you the know, buffer sort of, of my yeah, own, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. But I think that's so <laughs> crucial because the reality is, whatever context I was going to be in, I w- if I had gone to Pakistan, I would have struggled with religion like nobody's business, right? Because there there's so many issues in Pakistan as it relates to kind of, you know, what it means to be religious, what that looks like, what that means in that society, right? And so, you know, like uh, being at Exeter, there were not there were just a handful of Muslims, right. uh, but we kind of made community and uh, and you know, and it meant something to me. It was something which I was like, yeah, man, this is a part. This is who I am. This is a part of who I am. Like, hey, it's interesting because Noman's daughter just graduated from high school, and um, uh, you know, she's heading off to college, and and I was having a conversation with her and I was t- I was telling her I was like look man you're going to college 
you're going to discover doors that you like you want to walk through and you know and go walk through them you're going to discover doors you didn't think existed and yeah. you're going to walk through those and you're going to be on this path of who you want to become i was like but realize like you don't need to forget who you are in order to discover who you want to become the two can coexist together yeah, right right and be in relationship and i think oftentimes as parents we're like no 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 you you just who you are is all that matters forget about who you want to become mm. right and and when you don't leave that space then a lot of these kids man like they just they struggle because yeah. there's constant discovery going on um yeah. And then they just don't know how to kind of place it. And and I would I would meet a lot. I was you know, I was a Muslim chaplain at Penn uh, for a year, and I would meet a lot of like kids who would end up you know who were just struggling with yeah. with these things, right? Where they're they're they are really discovering other worlds, and they don't know how to navigate it because they haven't been given the tools to do so. Um, because really, par their parents have just been like. You can't change. Don't forget who you are, etc. It's like, man, like that's impossible, right? Mm -hmm. It's impossible to tell a kid who's going to college, don't change, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, no, I think going back to the two points that you made, kind of, I think you really masterfully distilled it down to those two things, which is, you know, children having a foundational, organic relationship with their faith, number one, and number two, the doors of communication and you know the the ability to go and, and speak with your parents about whatever's happening in your life. I think those are integral. And I would imagine as a chaplain, you would, you know, if you were to kind of think back now, you, you know, the, the people that you encountered who were struggling, something was missing along those two sort of uh, axes. Yeah, and, and usually it was a bit of both. Oh, right, right, right. And right. usually it was, it's definitely the communication piece. Mm -hmm. And they were just really afraid to communicate uh, whatever was going on with their family. And then there was also the piece, which was just, you know, sometimes we, we don't realize when I say organic, right? Yeah. Organic Thank is you. not going to be, you know, all right, like, have you memorized these surahs? <laughs> have you gone to Sunday school? Like, no, like I taught at Sunday school and that was glorified babysitting, honestly. Like it was glorified babysitting, <laughs> right? Where it was like parents were just leaving their kids. I mean, we were teaching them. But parents were leaving their kids to have like three or four hours on a Saturday where they're not yeah. taking care of their kids, right? Because <laughs> none of their kids were in the mindset of like, hey, I'm here to learn, yeah. right? Um, at all. Yeah. And so you were oftentimes, you're just kind of like trying to manage these yeah. kids and hoping you're imparting a little bit here and there. And like, I mean, I was a bad Sunday school teacher because I would end early and be like yeah let's go play soccer and then because that was where i was bonding with the kids yeah. and then maybe i could have some conversations with them where you know impart a little bit of kind of connection to islam etc yeah. so I, but so i think we get lost in that i mean the, the organic and again like i don't know if i'm doing it right with my kids right so i'm not pretending to be an expert but what i'm hoping is that my approach to them has been look I need to teach you some baseline things. One is you got to understand like Allah Ta'ala, like when they were really young, I would just tell them, I was like, you know, Allah Ta'ala is your best friend, like your best friend. Because Allah Ta'ala is going to be with you through your life after everyone has come and gone. Mm. Right? Allah Ta'ala is there from day one till the end. No one else will be there. Right. No one else is going to be there. Right. I mean, there'll be people maybe, you know, you you end up sort of but like you'll have friends who will come and go. You have family who will be, you know, oh, they're off to college. They started their own life. But Allah Ta'ala is with you constant, your friend. So be in conversation with Allah Ta'ala throughout your life. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't just mean in conversation when you're like praying. Yes, for sure. Like, I mean, like there's no limit. Like th yeah. that telephone line is open. Yeah. All the time. And so I was like, so that's one. But then I said, in order to truly have gratitude towards Allah Ta'ala and to have humility, you have to demonstrate those things with other human beings. Because you can't, if you are ungrateful to the 
waitress who has just served you at a restaurant, you are not going to cultivate the personality that can have gratitude to Allah Ta'ala, mm -hmm. true gratitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be something which, in my opinion, you'll construct because that, that's what you need to do. Oh, I have to be, I have to give shukr. But like to have a organic personality that's embodying that. And similarly with humility, yeah. right? Yeah. If you're unable to ask another human being for forgiveness because of a mistake that you've made, how are you going to be able to truly ask for forgiveness from Allah Ta'ala, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? And again, I, 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 you can do all those things because you'll get programmed in a particular way, but for me, the, the <clears throat> essence of the sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is the cultivation of those characteristics and those yeah. traits right. so that they're an organic part of your personality, and then that kind of Islam and the foundation of becomes, I think, just more deeply rooted. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't think that the conversation was going to go Sorry, here, but yeah. no, 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 I really appreciate it because uh, I was like, man, you know, we have someone of your caliber, you know, better get my A game on. But now I'm just kind of like reminiscing about my own background, kind of growing up, you know, my experiences right now as, as, as a parent. But I think you really just touched on so many critical issues you know, like for example, as as a as you know, someone who grew up to immigrant parents from the subcontinent, mm -hmm. like we grew up, uh, you know, my theology was like we didn't learn aqidah according mm -hmm. to the Maturidi tradition, right, you know, right. like as good little Hanafis or whatever. It was like okay, you know, uh, make dua to Alamia, right? And it was like even the even the vernacular there, yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, I'm sure in Pakistan it's the same. same. Like, Allah yeah. me, like yes. that relationship, man, yeah. that you just just by virtue of the vernacular and 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 how you call on Allah, Allah me, it's like it's yeah. it's this friendly, loving yeah. relationship, and that's always how my you know even though my parents may not have taught me the faraid and yeah. stuff, and, and, or it wasn't the the sort of they, obviously they taught it to me, but you know it wasn't like I wasn't learning a curriculum. Mm -hmm. But it was more like these type of like, okay, just having that informal enough of a relationship with Allah mm -hmm. that I could call him Allah Mia, for example, yeah, yeah. and not like sort of, you know, worry about having to navigate sort of theological, you know, boundaries by, you know, oh, dropping the, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, so, 100%. And, yeah. the, and look, you know, the, the interesting thing is in the American context, if you want to see a community that has kind of done that yeah you know imam warthin muhammad yeah his community and particularly so the true. person of imam warthin muhammad like he, he was yeah. in in many respects ahead of his time because if you if you recall like the types of things he was saying back then yeah and would get blasted by <laughs> the broader muslim community about it yeah, right yeah. oh this notion american islam like that he, he was he was at the forefront of really pushing those kind of ideas. Yes. And it would get blasted, yeah. right? Yeah. Or his sort of ideas around kind of your relationship with Allah Ta'ala, yeah. what exactly the sunnah is, right? right? These type of things, I mean, yeah. and so and so as a result, like in a lot of, you know, and again, it, it varies, but in, in, in the communities, Imam Warthi Muhammad's communities that I have, you know, either grown up in or been exposed to, like, I would find that organicness, yeah, um, that's a really and that good point. sort of, and, and in some respects, would be a very secure Islam. Whereas I would find in a lot of other places there would be like deep insecurities about sort of what's called uh, deep insecurities about the you know, apologies for the no. uh, coffee some grinder in the background. Oh, yeah. is that what that is? Yeah, oh, that was a coffee grinder. grinder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we got um, some ambient sounds yes. of Stanford coming at you. Oh, it might be. It's actually a vacuum cleaner. Oh, <laughs> it is my right. goodness. Okay. Well, all right. Well, um, that's okay. So, you know, I think that that, in, uh, you know, at yeah. the end of the day, like those things can exist, but it you would find sort of in other, and, and it's not all immigrant communities. There yeah. were a lot of immigrant communities where it's not the case, but you'd find like just insecurities about that Islam is just about to slip out of their hand mm. and slip out of their kids' hands. And mm -hmm. so they would just overcompensate in yeah. ways in which, you know, it just made it even harder, I think, for a lot of kids. And yeah. I mean, 
I'll give you an example. I mean, this is later in life, but like I was, I remember giving a chutbah at a masjid in, outside of Philly, and the chutbah was basically telling parents, "Hey, you need to understand your kids better and take it easy on them, right?" And like afterwards, there was just because usually the chutbah is on how, like, kids, you really need to respect your parents. <laughs> And I was kind of flipping the script yeah. a bit, and part and and you know I got uh, parents kind of came up to me afterwards, got and were some like, pushback, oh, you know, the, some yeah. pushback, and then they wanted me to come talk at the masjid. But part of what I was telling them, I was like, look, man, like your kid is coming home from school, and and you know she's a young woman, and she's asking, can she get like you know her the top of her lip waxed. And you're like, your response is stuff for love, this or whatever else, <laughs> right? And like, you don't sit for a moment and be like, hey, man, she's like a brown girl. You put her in a predominantly white school. She's she's a brown girl, like brown people. We're just hairy, right? <laughs> and so like, and she's she's dealing with this yeah. socially, et cetera. And you have, you have no capacity. You're not demonstrating any capacity to be like, okay, like, you know, let's sit down, let's, what's going on with you, right? And and so just trying to kind of situate yourself in their experience as you help them navigate how to be Muslim in their experience. I mean, that, I think it was just yeah, very difficult in the past. To be honest, it continues uh, in this generation a bit as well. Because as parents, you're always worried, of course, mm-hmm, but, mm-hmm. and you don't want the kids to go like astray or whatever else. But I think we, we have to build that that kind of foundation, then trust it and just be like, all right. I, I said that I didn't know that the conversation was going to yeah. go here, but I think it, knowing where I would like to take the okay. conversation and some of the things we talked about last night, even when we were kind of like just touching base about where what we want to talk about today, I think a lot of what we've covered is going to be fertile soil for what we, inshallah, sure. will talk about yeah, later yeah. in the show. But in order to kind of move the conversation along, you are undergrad Emory. So right. again, moving away from home, yeah. any sort of highlights? What was that like? I mean, uh, uh, undergrad Emory is there. I know, it, yeah. I think we talked about this last time you and I met mm-hmm. was uh, you had some, you know, you mentioned the Imam Warthi Muhammad community, but I mm-hmm. think you also living in Atlanta were able to interact with the Imam Jamil's community. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Imam Jamil's, right outside yeah. of Emory. I, I'm, yeah. Um, I visited in 1997, and that was one of the highlights of my trip, was yeah, yeah. Uh, to be able to spend like an afternoon with Imam Jamil himself yeah. outside of his little general food store and then go to the yeah. masjid with him. An amazing little community. And first time yeah, I ever yeah. heard the Adhan called on a loudspeaker in the United States oh, interesting. was his community. Yeah, there. yeah. No, he's that was back in the day, you know, he, yeah. had, he had kind of that, the masjid, the shotgun house, yeah. you know, where he's... You know, a shotgun house is like if you fire a shotgun, it goes all the way through, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's like single floor, and and I remember the first time I went to pray there because it's out in West End, and um, and like I'm sitting there, and Imam Jamil, like you know, he's a tall yeah. man, he just like comes in, and you can feel his presence as he walked past, and yeah, uh, and he gave the khutbah with the Quran in one hand and the sword in the other, which <laughs> oh, I'll wow. never forget. Yeah. Uh, and it was a yeah. powerful khutbah, man. Like he That's would, right. you know, he would not go there on occasion. He would give powerful khutbahs, um, really calling out uh, oh. folks. But you know, it, and and I have to say, I mean, two things that I have to say about that. Uh, you know, now that we're talking about Mount Jamil's community, one is. You know, Imam Jamil had a huge impact on that West End community, right? I mean, like, they were in there and they were dealing with, uh, you know, the drug issues and drug dealers and, and, you know, maybe not always in the ways that the authorities would have preferred, um, but they were dealing with this problem that existed. And right. they were likewise, man, I mean, you... They, they took care of business. They took Let's care of business. That, yeah, and, put it that way. And the thing was, they also did things like, you know, I, I remember there was a point where, like, the power got cut off. Imam Jamil had brothers posted from the Marta station throughout the neighborhood with flashlights directing people home so that yeah. people got home safe. Right. You know, like they, there was a lot of stuff that they were doing positive there, and yeah. then you know, and and obviously you can't talk about Imam Jamil without sort of mentioning the fact that you know he has been incarcerated now. I was for, just going to say I'm going to have to ask you to put on your criminal lawyer hat and kind yeah, of, yeah, I mean, you know, talk about that as well. I, I remember when the case, and again, I haven't looked into the case deeply 
uh, beyond sort of, yeah, I've wanted to, and I want to actually write on it at some point. But I think we've kind of neglected and forgotten him as a community. Oh, man. absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, I think that there are certain folks who haven't, right? You're there right. Are, you're right. Definitely, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't make that kind of a categorical. Um, there are definitely folks yeah. who have not. Yeah. Uh, and and his family has, has been... I've chatted his, with his son, actually. His no, son, his, wife, a lawyer. his yeah. wife is a lawyer yeah. as well. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, and so... Uh, and there, there are other members of the community who yeah. have, have really kind of pushed and um, uh, tried to keep the spotlight on it. And, you know, I, I remember when the situation happened and the initial news reports about like who the assailant was, was like the exact opposite description of Imam Jamil. And so it was all just like really strange, very weird how all of it went down. Um, and the kind of, you know, the fact that they were kind of serving a yeah. warrant to him, like in the evening, like it was just a weird, like mm. at a general store when more than likely it was going to be closed. There were just a lot of strange facts around the whole case. And then since then as well, you know, you can't help but think that like part of the prosecution of Imam Jamil is trying to sort of relitigate things from Thank you. the past and H. Rap Brown. And, and, you know, for those who don't know, Imam Jamil previously was H. Rap Brown, a very important figure in the Black in the Panther civil rights, yeah, civil uh, rights movement. Yeah, yeah. And, and less so Black Panther Party, but, but the student nonviolence. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he, he was absolutely kind of essential in that period of American history in a very loud and vocal voice, you know, famous, uh, you know, violence is as American as cherry pie and those type of statements. So, the, and there was a sense, I think, that they were never able to uh, put him away or whatever else and yeah. uh, for a long period of time. So, you know, there was a feeling in the community that, that when that happened and I was, you know, that he, they were sort of relitigating some of that past. Correct. Yeah, I mean, I have heard that there is, there's a group of folks who are a team of lawyers in the community who are sort of working on this based out of Atlanta, along with the family. Good. And uh, I think right now, the main uh, thing is that they sort of want to change his location in order to so he can have better medical care. Access to medical and, care, yeah. Access to medical care and yeah. put him in a different facility. And so we're hoping, inshallah, that happens. And yeah, I mean, I know a bunch of us who would kind of love to get involved. There's some folks who've written on this a little bit. Ubaid Siddiqui uh, has, uh, has written on as a journalist um, mm. sort of some of these uh uh, some of this kind of story of Imam Jamil. Okay. And so, yeah, let's see let's see what happens in the future. But it, it's something that some of us have been kind of pondering. But we also are careful not, you know, you don't want to have too many chefs in the kitchen. If yeah. there are folks working on it, right. then it's more of a how can we support you? What can we yeah. do? Uh, but I, I, there is a point where I would love to kind of uh, write no, on it. No, and you actually it. reminded me, or uh, again, about uh, I've been wanting to have on the show someone who can speak to that and some of the efforts yeah. that are ongoing, as well as sort of, what, you know, um, bring a lot of the people in the community up to you know up to date in terms of how we got where we are because again I think for people who didn't come of age in the 90s perhaps you know Imam Jamil is a figure that they either are not familiar with have not heard of or didn't realize or don't realize the the import and the impact that he had on the broader American Muslim community yeah and and look um, and, so. and you know part of that is and it would be great to do something like that just to give a sense yeah. of that history because a lot right. of these folks, you know, look, we had a uh, Imam Asim in uh, Philadelphia who uh, oh. was Imam of uh, Masjid Mujahideen, who, who was sort of from Imam Jamil's community, an extension of Imam Jamil's community there. And he, he passed away recently. And you, you think about the fact that, like, you know, and he, he he's left wonderful kids who, who are doing great work and they can kind of still tell stories about him. But you sort of miss out on this opportunity yeah. to... To talk to someone like him and and that history then just passes with yeah, him right um, right which is you know one of the reasons why I'm, I'm very keen there's a book project that i have which i've been kind of working on for a bit uh to tell um uh the story of sort of the philly muslim and it's basically centered around uh, masjid kuba uh which let's talk is, about that yeah, yeah because i was gonna say you know you you're, you're certainly not the first person that we've had on the show from from from, from philly mm -hmm. uh or at least who's who's had a lot of you know has, has lived there for an extensive amount of time um you're also by the way not the first 
person we've had from your alma mater of University of Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, we've had Dr. Jackson on the all show. Right. Uh, again, also from Philadelphia, but yeah. Dr. Omar. I mean, there's just so many people who whose, yeah, that, whose stories intersect yeah. in and, Philadelphia. Yeah. And just get yeah. us there between you know yeah. finishing up at Emory yeah, and getting yeah. and, okay. then, and then yeah. getting into sure. your masters and your and your advanced yeah, yeah, yeah. education. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, so I finish up at Emory. I went after I graduated. I spent two years working in the U.S. Senate. Um, so I was in the U.S. Senate uh, before and after 9-11. And a funny story with that is uh, on 9-11, I, I wasn't feeling well in the morning. And so I was like early in the morning and I like told my mom, I was like, you know, I, I was staying with my parents at that stage. And I was like, you know, I, I think I'm going to call in sick from work. At a certain point, my mom comes like running in and she's like, something has hit the World Trade Center. And I was like, I just assumed, I was like, oh, it's probably, it's probably nothing. There's probably like some, if anything, it's some kind of small plane. Small plane. It's like, yeah. you know, nicked it or something like that. And then the second plane hit and my mom was like, you have to get up and go to work. And I was like, what has happened? She's like, they're going to think it's you. And I was like, wow. and it was already her fears yeah. around, and nothing had been announced at that stage, but there were such fears that it already you know, become present for her that it was like, if this is Muslims yeah, and yeah. you're not present, like all this yeah, stuff, you know, yeah. and, um, and obviously I, I didn't go back in cause it was complete chaos. And, and I mean, I went in the very next day and was on the floor. You're working in the Capitol building. Yeah. Yeah. I worked okay, for okay. Senator Max Cleland did, from Georgia. Did oh, you have, okay. did you have, uh, what, what were your career aspirations at this point? Was it on a subject or was it more political? No, it was, it, I was hugely involved in civil rights activism when I was in college, particularly, uh, around issues relating to race, policing, police brutality. So Amadou Diallo mm -hmm. was shot and killed while we were in college. Um, so we did a lot of activism there and, and protest and marching and with both on the college campus, but then with the Atlanta community, Reverend Markell, others. So I was kind of involved with a lot of that stuff. And, and then on campus as well, you know, we'd have issues around Confederate flag, blackface, all these things that kind of happened. And so we had a group that had formed. Of, there was like five of us who sort of were, were doing a lot of the, pushing the administration. And, and it was a different time than now. So that type of stuff wasn't, you know, too common. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we brought Reverend Al Sharpton for a walk around campus, quote unquote, and it was meant to kind of just intimidate the administration into making some changes. But but one thing while I was doing that activism was I realized like, you know, I didn't quite know how change would work through the government, right? We, we like would get letter writing campaigns to like, you know, our representatives, but I didn't quite know like how should that letter be framed, who should be sent to all this stuff. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I, I graduate college. I go to Morocco for three months to do Arabic. And then I come back and I start in the senator's office. Uh, was that through CASA at the No, at the no, 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 no. That okay. was actually, I found the only program I could find at that time was through VMI, Virginia Military Institute. Their students were going, but they let non-VMI students go. Okay. And so there was like, I think two of us were non-VMI. Uh, which was an interesting summer because I, yeah. I I pushed their buttons a lot. Uh, not pushed their buttons. I I challenged them to like think through different things, and so it was it was fun. I mean, I made a couple of real good friends, but I was there for the you know the Arabic. Right. And it was actually interesting because I I met people like Abdullah Hamad Ali and others mm, for the first time right. okay. out there in yeah. in, uh, in Fez. But yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, yeah. So I we went and we you know I came back from that and I just joined the Senate and okay. worked there from, so this is like 2000 to through 2002. Um, and uh, yeah, Senator Cleland, who was an amazing person, like, you know, triple amputee. That's right. Uh, from Georgia, Democrat. Um, so I, I was a legislative staff reform. But the other thing, which was amazing. Again, a name that I think, you know, a lot of young people listening to the show may not be familiar with, but I yeah. remember... Uh, you know, during the George Bush administration, I mean, yeah. his was a name you would hear a lot. Yeah. And certainly the Republicans 
demonized. Oh, I hardcore. Mean, right, yeah. right. His, his, when he was up for re-election, yeah, I mean, they really right. they ran some really nasty ads. They did. The uh, what was it? Uh, yeah. they, they, uh, what eventually became a verb, they swift boated him. Yeah, they swift boated him. Yeah. And it was, it was pretty, it was nasty because he lost his limbs in Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, you know, but then spoke out. The, the the crime, so to yeah. speak, was to speak out against the war. Speak out against uh, the war. And and again, at that yeah. time, I think it was during the um real it was during the re-election of George Bush when he ran against Kerry, Kerry. Yeah. and they were trying to do the same thing with Kerry because again, Kerry like yeah, uh, yeah. Senator you know, and Leland. Kerry much more so even than that's right Cleveland. Kerry was like doing hearings and everything else. You know, and Senator Cleveland, you know, he spoke out, but he was right. still it was, but it was just it was it was the beginning of kind of these like nasty Karl Rove tactics. There um, yeah. And it was Saxby, Saxby Chambliss. Oh, another name. <clears throat> who's the one who who ran those ads? And right. you know, McCain and yeah. Hagel and others came out against it, and who were GOP, but were like, "Hey, man, this crosses the line." Mm-hmm. Like, because they they ran ads comparing, you know, it would be like Bin Laden's picture, yeah. Saddam Hussein, and Max Cleland. It's like, come on, man. Like, you know, this guy is like, uh, anyway, he yeah. spent a lifetime of service and all that. But but it, the what I was gonna say yeah. is the the greatest part of that experience, <clears throat> or the biggest learning was that once a week, five of us would rotate with the senator. We would be with him. We'd pick him. We'd take over at noon, and we would be his right-hand person. We would be his body person. Take him to, you know, home in the evening. Then next morning, pick him up until noon. We base wherever he went, we got to go. Yeah, that's amazing. Man, those were some experiences. It's like I'm on the floor of the Senate on September 12th. Hmm. When they're voting to yeah. authorize war, I'm I'm in the room with like 50 senators, the Surgeon General, a couple other folks, and me when the anthrax issue happens. I'm just sitting there. I'm like a fly on the wall, yeah. right? And you end up hearing crazy things. You hear, all this, but then it's also like, oh, senators got to meet the president today. Like you go, right? Yeah. And so. And or senators meeting with like six CEOs or whatever else, and then so you're privy to the types of conversations yeah. that are happening, yeah. the kind of shady stuff as well, or whatever you want to yeah. call it. You know, politicians have to put up with the fundraising that's just like yeah. craziness. In terms of and, the um, because I remember just sort of because I knew people who were part of that cohort of Muslims on Capitol Hill, as it were. So I didn't know that you sort of intersect with that history. So people yeah. like Asim Ghafoor, yeah, who yeah, is yeah. a relative of both of ours, actually. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if you even know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, 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 right, right. Awesome. Yeah, right. Yeah. We were, yeah, campaigning hard when he was with the whole yeah, UAE yeah. stuff. But like Faisal Gill, his partner, mm-hmm. and just that period of history is so unique. I mean, in fact, I think there, there's a Juma there, yeah, services yeah. being held on Capitol Hill. Yeah, yeah. And we're all lucky. He's like giving the chutzpah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! So there was just yeah. I yeah. Mean, that that like that's was, that yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was and and the thing was like you know and so it's funny because so awesome and those guys had been around for a while. They were they were like kind of like early earlier, yeah. but they were all on the house side. Oh right right. right. You're so on they're the all Senate on the house side. side. That's right. The Senate side was even fewer. Folks, I see. Right. I, see. I okay. mean, to the it was like for Hannah Kara who was at Russell Feingold, and I think. Maybe Khalil Munir was somewhere in the Senate as well, and wow, me. I had no idea. And okay. and it was to the point where, like, I know Khalil may have been on the uh, House side, too. And then there were other folks who would kind of, and now names are escaping me right now, but, Gregory Meeks' office, other yeah. places. But it was, like, to the point where, you know, the Thanksgiving breakfast after 9-11, there's, like, uh, it's a kind of service-type breakfast. So people, senators would get up and give little speeches, mm-hmm. faith-related. Like, I gave the Muslim one hmm. because there was like, I mean, there were no Muslim yeah. senators, obviously. We didn't have any Muslim representatives. We barely had any Muslims up there. Yeah. So I remember it's like, I think Joe Lieberman handed me the mic or like, you know, it was just like a weird, it was <laughs> like, great. you know, all these like senators and they're like, uh, this little guy comes yeah. up and I, I was like. No, but what read, I appreciate yeah. is, and, and to your point, you know, what you teased earlier yeah. about the Philadelphia community thing. I mean, we're, we're capturing a history which needs to be told. And I think yeah, just, yeah. I didn't even know, like I said, about your background and your work there, because, you know, one of the, I mean, one of the key objectives of our show has always been to sort of capture this oral history uh, yeah. of our community in the United States. I mean, so this is a really important chapter. Yeah. 
yeah, man. And, and fascinating one that and, you're talking about. And the, and the person, who, his yeah. name's come to me now, is Jamil Alam Johnson, man. He was chief of staff for Gregory Meeks for ages. You know, and just like bird's eye view on everything happening. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there, it was an interesting period, man. And then obviously 9-11 happens, and so you're sort of, you're Muslim, you're there, you're sort of, it's just a very weird emotional yeah. time because you, you see the country changing. Yeah. Like, you see, and you, you yeah. know... It's just not going to look... I mean, another fun anecdote. I literally... Before 9-11, I had gotten this idea that I wanted to... I, I felt like there were all these like really smart Muslims who were either in academic programs or doing other stuff and just like writing about Muslim like or had thoughts about life in America as Muslims, whatever else. So I was like, hey, like I'm going to gather a bunch of chapters together of these people kind of reflecting on whatever they wanted to. Could be academic, it yeah. could be less. And it was like 23 people. And I'm talking about Intisar Rub, Suad Abdul Khabir, Jonathan Brown, Najam Haider, like all these people who've gone on to like just and I have these like chapters that they were Harun Mughal, chapters that they've written from like this, you know, they were basically undergrads yeah. or like a little bit removed from it. Fascinating. And 9-11 happened, and the paradigm shifted so much that, like, publishers were just like, yeah, we need something that now is capturing 9-11 and all that. Mm, and so the book yeah. project just got, it's literally, it's its on a floppy disk somewhere. Wow. Um, but its it was such a paradigm shift right. um, at that time. And For our younger listeners, a floppy <laughs> disk. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. But no, let's uh, yeah. let's talk about That's, now, yeah. does the, does, for this type of work and when you're working in the Senate, is it just a shelf life? How do yeah. you decide that I'm going to now go to law school and do something different? And what was that thing you were kind of, what was your vision? Yeah, so there isn't a shelf life for everybody. In fact, I would say the folks who, if you truly want to take that policy route, longevity is the key. It's yeah. not even degrees. It's not, It's longevity. If you stay there, you put in your time, you'll rise up to whatever position you want. And, and you see people, Rima Dodin is a prime example. I mean, she's be great to have on the show. Okay. Because she was also, she eventually ended up in Dick Durbin's office uh, from Illinois yeah. and was there for ages and was like, she was kind of the, the person in his office and now is in the White House and is like, you know, doing like major things. And she's a powerhouse, right? But she's had longevity. She's just been there. And what re gets rewarded in the policy world is institutional knowledge. Like, you know how the institution works so you can get stuff done. You have relationships mm -hmm. with people so you can get stuff done. So, yeah. So, but for me, it was... I, I wanted to be there to learn so that I could, whatever activism, whatever other stuff I wanted to do, I could do it better, right? So whatever issue it was, whether it was on like issues as it relates to you know, like Palestinian, you know, liberation, freedom, whatever else, or, or rights, if you will, mm -hmm. whether it's civil rights stuff, whatever it is that I was interested in, understanding Capitol Hill, understanding D.C., was essential to that. And so, and I got that education, but I think what's what happened with 9-11 was that it also then sparked in me this idea that like, man, like the world has changed in many ways. I've had this long standing interest in language. I mean, I'd just been in Morocco. Mm -hmm. I loved my time in Morocco. And I was just like, I really felt like I needed to know, I needed to solidify my knowledge of Arabic for myself and my knowledge of some other languages as well, but also just do take advantage of an opportunity to go study, understand Islam better, et cetera, because I felt like Islam was going to be part of the conversation for some years going ahead. And so it just kind of merged together. And I had been working on my master's in the evenings, and my master's thesis was uh, Jihad of the Wretched, examining Islamic militancy through the eyes of Franz, Franz Fanon. Through the thought of Franz Fanon, so it was I like no all idea. around. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So it was all around Fanon and Islamic militancy. So, so it was just. So I, I basically, I left the senator's office. I went. This and, could become like an eight-hour. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Episode. I was, I'm, try, I'm trying to move it along, but I, I left the senator's office. I went. I worked for Cynthia McKinney. It, 
to help her out with um, some stuff in election filings and things like that uh, for a few months. And then and then I went overseas and okay. I went uh, I went to study in Syria for like four months or so. And then I went to Pakistan and I studied there more for, like classical, traditional. Yeah, traditional stuff, uh, you know, at mo. You and know, your interest in language are all like sort of Islamic languages, right? Yeah, yeah, it's Islamic language. Yeah, it's so Urdu. it was it was mainly Arabic. Arabic okay. Uh, then Urdu, I yeah. wanted to kind of get at a higher level, right. and then Farsi, I just wanted to have as well because I, I love uh, uh, Farsi poetry or Persian yeah. poetry. Right. Um, and so I just wanted to dabble in all mm -hmm. that. But then it was, you know, it was mainly that, and then I went. It, I wanted to just study these sciences. Um, and so you're. Meanwhile, you're at you're at Penn. No, oh, at this point, sorry. I haven't even gotten pen. This oh, okay. is, I leave the Senate. Because you said master's. At Georgetown. Oh, what? The M MLS in, oh, you weren't that paying came attention. First. No, 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 I the, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought the MLS was. Yeah, yeah, I, no, so yeah, it was the, the International Air Affairs one. Yeah. I was, ra I was sort of working on that uh, during while I was yeah. in the Senate. Got it. And part of that had given me an indication. You know, I was, I loved the Senate work, but I was like drawn to thinking in, in okay. sort of broader ways and more academic ways. I'm curious, so. like, who you're encountering at this time in, because you're in D.C., so, and, yeah. and at that time period, I'm, I, mean, I imagine, you know, there's, there's Seyed Hussein Nasser down the street. There's, oh, yeah. Uh, Suleiman Niang, uh, yeah, Rahimullah, yeah. who passed yeah, away. Yeah. Uh, who else am I? Uh, Said, oh, I already mentioned Nasser. John Esposito, yeah, right, Esposito, in, right yeah. in Georgetown. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Esposito was there. Espos Anyone I'm sort of missing? Maybe? No, those are okay. those are sort of the, yeah. uh, at least in the D.C. area. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I would. Because I don't even know if yeah. Adams and Imam Majid is a thing yet. It's not a yeah. big thing. Yeah. It's starting to become. Right. Um, oh, oh, you have, you have a... Uh, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Tahir uh, Jabir al Wani. Yeah, so, so, yeah, again. yeah. So I, I did a Lum al Quran class with him during that period. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. I went out to like, he had like an institute, it was like Leesburg. I remember, or so I was like, I way thought it was in Herndon. Out. It wasn't in Herndon at that time. I, I just remember at that yeah. point, yeah. I just felt like ages away. Yeah. So it could have been Herndon, yeah, but yeah. Herndon was like farmland back in the day. Triple IT or Triple ISS, IT yeah, and all that. Yeah, so, but yeah, he okay. taught. In a Lum al Quran class um, that I would go out to, he was he was uh, a giant. He was a giant. He was yeah. huge. Yeah. And then there was also there was also a period of time where Sayyid Hussein Nasser taught a class in the community on uh, like three major figures in Islamic history, like uh, Sufi figures, Hawardi, Ghazali, and I think one other. And I used to go out for that too. I mean, those it was a wow. fun period, right? Yes. Um, and it was, and there was a good like circle of folks. Uh, the I don't know if you guys ever knew Ahmed Hussein. Uh, yes, the late, yeah. late, yeah. Uh, the um, late Ahmed uh, MLI. No, uh, no. Well, uh, not MLI. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a whole other conversation. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Muslim literal literacy. literary. Yes, I don't know what he had on yeah. that, but I knew him in the period where he was. Uh, he, you know, he yeah. was in that community. There was. And it was his house and Perfez but you know, like, and there would just be like great sohba there, yeah. man. Like you yeah. just, you'd go and it was like biryani and chai and like conversations about Islam. Yeah. And wow. it was just yeah. like deep stuff. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So well, it was like that period of time. It's an acronym. It's close to MLI. I mean, I mean, I, obviously MLI means something completely it's a different, different right game. now. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but so, no, no, yeah. it was something with Muslims and literature. Uh, like something literature. like that. Yeah, That's yeah. Why, so sorry, I want to let's saying. talk a little about Philly because last yeah. time when we had just when we were watching the game yeah. and oh and, uh, and and just catching <laughs> yeah, up for yeah. the first time, we talked a lot about Philly. Now yeah. that was an, a fascinating discussion yeah. because I was I was asking you just about the Muslim culture in Philly. Yeah, yeah. So really, really quick, get us to Philly. Like, how do you decide to get go to Philly and do your your JD and eventually yeah. your PhD yeah. and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and then I'd love, I want to dive into Muslim yeah. culture in Philly too. So, yeah, that let, was a, let's such an dive interesting right conversation. In, so the, how I get there is simple. I had applied to law schools. I got into a few, Penn yeah. was one of them. And um, it was it was in proximity to DC where my parents are. And I felt like that's one that made sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so I just, I started law school and this is like 2003. At that point, I didn't really think I'd do a PhD, but once I started law school, I just, I missed studying and delving into Islam and, and, and just, you know, Islamic law and other things, because I'd had this great experience. Mm -hmm. And that one year, 
uh, in Pakistan in particular, and they were intense. I was doing like six, seven hours a day, one-on-one -on -one with different teachers. And that was also where I sat in uh, Javed Ramdi's circles. And uh, I want to come back to Dr. And, and are those all, all uh, like mm -hmm. JD, MA, and PhD all from that same experience in, in Philly, right? In yeah, Penn. in Philly, yeah, um, Penn. Was that all one program or did you have to no. keep applying for the night and keep going? So uh, the JD was one program. Then I applied for the PhD sort of two months after starting okay. my JD. And then the PhD had within it a master's okay. that you had to complete first. So that's okay. kind of how it went. And so, yeah, so I basically have been in Philly since 2003, give or take sort of a year here in Syria, a couple years working in And your family, and your in-laws and all are from in -laws Philly. In-laws and all are from Philly, yeah. now in the suburbs of Philly, but they started within the city yeah. as well. And and I was yeah. asking you mm. back to kind of kind of yeah. our, our topic, the hot topic of yeah. this, your kids in Philly. Like, what did what is the effect of like the 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 walking down the street and hearing the the person on the street saying Inshallah, may, oh. who may or may not even be Muslim? Yeah, right? and, and what's the effect one, of like on the absolutely, psyche? Absolutely, man. And so, and one thing just to sort of connect to Dr. Jackson, you know, I'm part of Dr. Jackson's Isnad. <laughs> Right, because he's a Penn yeah, PhD from right. the same department, and he, so yeah, he in is. terms of he he has he's a Makdisi student. I was going to say his son goes through yeah, Makdisi. Yeah. Yeah. My 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 <laughs> dissertation advisor Joe Lowry oh. was also in that line, yes. and so I'm I'm part of that Makdisi school. So I always <laughs> joke with him, you know, that I'm I'm like. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm part. He's in. He's he's branch, in my chain. Different branch. Yeah, different branch. Well, a lower rank. I was going to wait yeah, for you yeah, to get to your masters before delving into yeah. that because there's Roger Allen. There's uh, Barbara uh, uh, von Schlegel. Von yeah, Schlegel. she she left a while back right. though. Okay. But okay. Now it's Paul Cobb and that's right. Uh, Jamal Elias is there. But in terms, let me talk about Philly because I do. Yeah. I feel like it's Philly doesn't get the type of recognition within. The Muslim community. I think when we talk about Muslim deserves. capitals of the United States, I mean Chicago yeah. certainly gets its credit. You know, yeah. it's uh, Chicago due, gets due, its due, but New Philly York gets its due. Yeah, Philly is like light years. It is like I, I can't. It, it's so, so hard to describe to you. I want to know. I'm Philly, fascinated. Philly is the densest Muslim, densest Muslim population in any major American metropolitan city. In the, in the proper city, in the downtown. In the yeah, city, yeah. So and this, in the, whatever the boundaries of the okay. city is, right? New I, York I has be, a lot of Muslims, yeah. Yeah. but it's not, like, they're spread out, right? There's such a big population. Philly is a, it's a smaller population in terms of, uh, as a city than, like, New York City, right? There are so many Muslims. And I'm talking about, like, on every... You cannot go anywhere in the city of Philadelphia and not come across Muslim, right? Um, it, I, o Omer, yeah. you know, Omer joined as co-host about about two and a half, three years ago. Yeah. Um, now, but almost um, four, so, almost four. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'll forgive you this, but I, I, in fact, you know, some of our earlier episodes, because of the frequency, yeah. because of the amount of guests that we've had whose paths intersect with Philadelphia, mm -hmm. we've actually talked a lot mm. about the Muslim community and, yeah. and the history of Islam mm. in Philadelphia. Oh, wow. Yeah. Definitely encourage you to, or encourage listeners yeah, yeah. to, to go back and, and, and dive into that part of the podcast because it is such a rich history. So I think it, it, a badge of honor for uh, for me, yeah. at least as a co-host uh, and for the show, is yeah. that we have, we're certainly not guilty of the fact that we've overlooked Philadelphia no, as a Muslim capital. Yeah. Um, states, you know, like the State Street Mosque and, and, and a lot yeah, of that yeah. rich you, history. Yeah. But I, but I think that your book that yeah. you've been, you know, yeah, percolating well, in your yeah. mind, inshallah, needs to come to fruition. No, but, I hope so, yeah. man, because but, uh, part of it but is... But please, yeah, go yeah. back to Omar's point. Well, too. just, I, wanna... I mean, just to give you yeah. a sense of the place, right? Yeah. I mean, they're like, so, and again, the community, the Muslim community there that I'm speaking about is predominantly African-American, right? You have huge pockets, Palestinian, there's like three villages from Palestine, you know, in North Philly. And it's like the whole village, like, you know, they're just there. So huge Palestinian, Sudanese population, one of the largest Moroccan diasporas in the country, wow. a growing Indonesian population, and in the Northeast now, a massive Uzbek population. That's basically folks coming down from uh, New York during COVID and all resettling and just 
there's like these halal Uzbek steakhouses mm. all up the northeast in these like hardcore traditional working class white neighborhoods and you just like randomly like Samarkand is like there <laughs> wow. amazing food right and then Bengali population massive Bengali population towards Upper Dhabi the Indian Pakistanis have shifted much more to the suburbs Syrians as well much more to the suburbs mm -hmm. But the, the black, the African-American population, you're talking about people who are now third, fourth generation Muslim. Mm, like right. the first masjids, Sunni masjids in Philadelphia are starting back in the 40s, yeah. right? And and the movements, obviously the huge Ahmadiyya movement yep. there and still a presence. And, and the movements you've and got. And by Ahmadiyya, just real quick, I mean, mm -hmm. Ahmadiyya within the black Muslim community. Well, initially yeah, outside, yeah, yeah. but then within well, right. the black community, no, no, initially right? Out, yeah, right, right. initially outside, but then within the black community doing dawah, and then those folks sort of eventually making their way to Sunni Islam. So yeah. what, I, I'm saying simple. that because it's sort of the trajectory of like nation Islam to Sunni Islam, that happened as well in Philly, but you also just had like very early on like Sunni Muslims, right? Yeah. And and so there's just this, and and then it became, and in many respects still is the like the mecca of Salafi Islam in America. I was about to say, like it is, it was for the longest period. It was Orange, New Jersey, and Philadelphia. And there's um, I forget what his name is from St. Louis, Umar. Umar Lee or mm, Umar, yeah. Umar Lee, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He he wrote a blog he post did. many yeah, many I years ago yeah, on all this, right? That's right. But it's That's right. like it is accurate in the sense of like Philadelphia, it, Salafi Islam is like every and it's ground zero for and 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 at times violent history of confrontation between the within the Salafi movement in the nineties. Oh yeah, QSS, Ayana, all of it plays out. Yeah. On the streets of Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. And still, you know, and not not to that violent extreme, but there's yeah, right. still sort of the oh. battlegrounds. The folks who we might think in the national conversation yeah. are like Salafi are basically rejected as like yeah. liberals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell, a lot tell, of parts of Philly. Tell they me are. But how, the how it, yeah. Sorry. Tell me tell me how it plays out in terms of how the impact of that on like your family, for example, uh, you know. So you know, so the Salafi stuff plays out. Not so. I mean, it just it just means that in the city itself, Islam is everywhere, mm -hmm. right? So I'll give you examples, right? You, I show up in Philly, and I'm like, I went to the Walmart, and I was like, enter Walmart. It was on Columbus Boulevard, and like the greeter <laughs> is there, and he's like, you know, hey, welcome to Walmart, and you can see right away he's got the beard, you know, the the jeans are cut off. Like, all right, coming in. As soon as he spots me, sees that I have yeah. a beard, the greeting is no more like, welcome to Walmart. He's like, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. <laughs> welcome to Walmart, right? Like it is, and so there's no kind of, yeah. you know, there, no one's shy about their Islam there yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. right? you, you, and, and then I'm going, I remember I wanted to get a wallet or something. The lady's like, oh, I need to get my manager. Manager comes, full niqab. Niqab is... Like Adi, it's normal in Philly. Like to see Nikabi women is like not a big deal. It's like it's there. Like, and so you just from that perspective, even for a period of time, the culture within the city was wearing long white t-shirts below the knees and having jeans that were above your ankles. That's all coming from Islam. That's all coming from Muslim culture and its influence within the city. Wow. Right? Yeah. Even to this day, if you go in Philly and you're like, you go into a barbershop in black neighborhoods, you go into a black barbershop and you're like, hey, I need you to like fix up my sunnah. They know that means you need your beard like hooked up nice. That's what, like, you need to work on my sunnah. Like, that's what it is. That's yeah. the Philly beard is the Sunni beard. Yeah. Right, and so and so the whole beard culture in Philly is all coming from Islam, but what does that do for my kids? What it does for my kids is, you know, they and and I used to tell my wife this all the time. She grew up in Philly, born and raised in Philly. I was like, you don't know the experience of living in a non-Muslim city, like you just you don't <laughs> understand, right? Because like you're yeah. you're just used to islam everywhere you're used to just the fact that like people will just know what halal is or like we'll just know and so even for my kids it's one of those things like my my son was because the thing with islam in philly is muslims are everywhere right 
They are the ones who are fixing the potholes on the street and the ones who are, you know, deputy district attorneys, yeah. right? Like they're in the mayor's office and they're doing construction everywhere in between. Right. And so, like, and like I tell people, it's a Muslim city. The cops and the robbers are Muslim, right? <laughs> like there's a famous story yeah. uh, that uh, this one imam tells where he was like, he was, he was going to the masjid. And he was late to pray Maghrib. And, he, and so he's like on his way and he gets robbed on the way. And he's like, they're like, give, you know, he's like giving them his stuff, etc. And he's like, look, man, just take whatever. I'm late. I got to get to the masjid for Salat. And they're like, oh, you're Muslim? He's like, yeah, man, I'm the imam. I got to lead Salat. And they just like started handing everything back. They're like, stuff for Allah, stuff for Allah. Just forgive us, imam. Right? <laughs> like, he was being robbed by Muslims, right? Yeah. And it's, I, I'm not saying like all Muslims robbed, but just to give you a sense, no. you know, that it's like, it is a Muslim city. Yeah. So you're, the, oftentimes, you know, we sometimes within like the immigrant diaspora as well, we sort of have a notion of like, oh, like it's, if, if it's, you know, uh, someone, uh, black people are only co converts to Islam or reverts to Islam. And it's only like, pure and pristine Islam. No, like Islam has existed in black communities now for decades. And all the things that you years, right? Yeah. 80 years. All the things you're going to see when you go to Lahore, when you go to Amman, when you go to like, you know, Fez, you're going to see in these black Muslim cities, Detroit, right. Right. Chicago, New York, but Philly for sure, right? right. You're going to see all of that. And 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 you know, you so it's also like for the for my kids as well, you know, you end up seeing things where it's like my son was uh, starting kindergarten, first day of school. He's like heading into the uh, kindergarten lot, and there's like a Muslim woman, full like galabia, you know, wearing the galabia, got like hijab on, hijabified. I don't know if you know hijabified. It's like a brand, <laughs> yeah, anyway. Yeah, brand. Oh, um, okay. And I was like, oh, this Muslim. She was the teacher, the special. Like there was one kid who had special needs and she was a special needs teacher uh, or assistant in the class. And I was like, oh, I saw her. And I was like, oh, I told my son, I was like, you know, make sure you give her salams. And he's like, oh, really? Like, I was like, yeah, yeah. You know, he's nervous first day. So he's like walking by and he's like, salam alaikum. You know, he's like, <laughs> and she is like, wa alaikum salam. Like just all this love and not shy about it. And the thing is, like, no one blinked an eye, yeah. right? None of the, like, white folk, none of the black no one blinked an eye because it's, yeah, it's, it's Philly. Like, there are Muslims everywhere. Uh -huh. So I think it just, it creates a different sort of level of security. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, Dr. Jackson. I mean, he often talks about indigenizing Islam to America. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what indigenizing Islam yeah, looks yeah, like. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and it, it plays out in, like you said, these predominantly... Yeah. Um, you know, inner city, urban, black, or Muslim communities. For sure. Where we've seen it for yeah. generations now. It does. And yeah. one of the sad things that, you know, yeah. it was going to happen, but, you know, that did end up happening is that you, there was a period of time where there was, like, immigrant and black Muslims, yeah. and they were all, like, within the cities, right? Like, I remember my father-in-law, uh, you know, who passed away, he, um, when I first got married, me and him went to some masjid, and, like, it, it was a predominantly African-American Muslim. And he knew all the old heads there. Like, they were all, it was like, oh, they, they knew each other because they had all been come up in Islam and Philly. And, like, he was chatting it up with folks who I was like, man, how do you know him? How do you know that? Mm -hmm. um, and, but then a lot of those immigrants, like, yeah. went out to the suburbs. Right. Um, right. And, you know, for them, that made sense. and all, But then they also took resources to the suburbs. So there, there became this sort of distance, mm -hmm. um, which which is unfortunate. I mean, some still stay connected, but, right. it, it you know, and so in some respects, that experience and that kind of uh, indigenizing mm -hmm. that... You're right. No, I mean, and, and we see it play out even in places like Chicago, for example, where you've got people from the south side who eventually, you know, go out to the suburbs and they lose that connection that, that they once shared. Um, right. You know, we've had imams from that community who yeah. talk about that, yeah. you know, no. and, and so the, um, the immigrant and indigenous, if you will, um, you know, communities were far more entrenched 
you know, a few decades ago. Yeah, and uh, mm-hmm. but I think then it's it's really on sort of our generation yeah. and the next generation folks to reestablish those yeah. linkages, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and to really and 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 to kind of, you know, I write the history. Or I want to write the history of Islam in Philadelphia, not simply because that history needs to be told. I, I write it because that's my history, mm. right? Like that's my history. Yeah. And that's how we have to approach this, right? It's like, it's not, it's not simply, oh, this is like a history that like it, it has tangential relationship to, no, that's my history. Like j- in the same way that I embrace the history of like Islam in Morocco, Islam in like, you know, the Arabian mm-hmm. Peninsula, Islam in Turkey, like I embrace that as my history, right? Mm-hmm. When I read about the Ottomans, when I'm reading about the Mamluks, I'm embracing that as my history. And that's one of the beautiful things about Islam is like day one, when you become Muslim, all that history is yours. And we have to embrace that. And then it's the same way, I think, for this rich history in America of Islam and, and kind of how, I mean, the, the stories there I could talk about for ages. No, no, I yeah, hear you. Just, and you I'm know. just kind of thinking of how we, where we go from here okay. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I was uh, defer to Umar to get out of, uh, <laughs> out of uh, Well, yeah. let's, so, so obviously, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, I know you teased the idea of a book, but you do have other publications. So yeah. maybe that's a pivot yeah. to talk about the, the sure. stuff that you have written on. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I write, my obsession, uh, I guess, academically or scholarly obsession is is on this thing about disrupting frameworks and yeah. of how we think about things, particularly in kind of Western academia. But Which we you literally just gave me, that's disrupting a framework. How do yeah. you think about Philly and how, how do you think about exactly. history and how does that affect yeah. the yeah. kids so and all that? that's kind of how I... But part of that for me in, in my dissertation was on Fard Kifaya, on collective obligations, collective duties in Islamic law. Um, and I'm obsessed with this idea of duty, particularly as a legal scholar. You know, our kind of normative, our primary framework about thinking about law and all is really from the standpoint of rights. Mm-hmm. And I've found a lot of my scholarship is kind of pushing back against the fact that this is the only way to think about things. Because I think for a lot of parts of the world, particularly in the global south, but beyond, the framework with which they think about the world is through duty, right? What is your responsibility? What's your responsibility to others? What do you owe as opposed to what you're entitled? And so much of my scholarship, you know, has kind of looked at that. I've looked at it, kind of looked at how duties and collective duties function in the context of jihad Mm -hmm. um, and sort of the transformations that have happened in in kind of the 80s, uh, late 70s, 80s uh, in how that was framed, looked at it in the Arab Spring, where this we have this existential moment and suddenly like the Sunni world is having to grapple with revolution against the status quo, um, which is just very new. And they frame everything as a duty, that right. there's a duty now mm-hmm. that people have to protest. That's how the framing happens for a lot of the ulama who were pro-protest, pro- right? Mm. They started saying it's a fard <laughs> kifaya for yeah. you to go to a sit-in. It's a fard kifaya to like, you know, uh, engage in these um, activities. And then they started saying, oh, well, you know, part of why, like in Yemen, they were talking about the fact that, oh, like the government had certain duties to its population. Yeah. They have uh, not uh, they have they haven't undertaken them, and so now this has disrupted this social contract. So they're they're bringing these sort of other frames of thinking through this. Um, right. So that's all part of it, and and I, for me, like my latest. So my, the book I'm writing about is looking at the idea of that I've been writing for this year here, is more of a pre-modern picture. So I'm looking at uh, kind of the late Abbasid era, right? You're looking at kind of mid 10th century to when the Abbasids kind of finish up in the mid uh, sort of 13th, right? Um, And I'm basically looking at this time period and I'm I'm asking this question where a lot of this law around duties and collective obligations just sort of explodes on the scene. And ulama are writing about it a lot more. And I, in my dissertation, I basically lay out what they're writing about. And it's fascinating because they are talking about 
the context of jihad and how it functions, the context of duties that are owed to the dead, but then rescue duties, right? That they, they, they talk the sort of framing duty and example they use is what is far. So I should explain what Fard Kifaya is. Right? Oh, right, Fard right. Kifaya is basically um, where everybody has a duty to perform some particular act, but as long as some people in the community perform it, it satisfies the duty for everybody else, Correct. right? Individual obligations are like prayer, fardain, yeah, fardain right? Mm -hmm. uh, are like prayer where no one else can perform it for you. You have to perform it. So I, I'm looking back historically and I'm asking in the Abbas period, why does this emerge? And my theory is that basically mid 10th century, you have major sort of existential moment where the you know the khalifa had lost a lot of power but it was the first time where these military commanders entered baghdad okay in kind of a show of force they didn't take over but a show of force the buyids and i think that created an existential crisis of sorts and what the jurists and the fuqaha then felt needed to happen was how do we create cohesion create cohesion in the community such that the civilizational project of islam can sustain itself even if the polity disappears right that how do you create linkages between people between muslims yeah. that can transcend any particular political dynasty and obligation is such a great way to do that, right? right. Um, and so they just continue to expand this category. Of Fardai uh, Fard Fard Kifaya. They just so continue prior to, to that, you're saying then that there's not so much, there, there isn't a lot of discussion around communal obligations. No, there, so there's discussion around Fard Kifaya, but it's very sparse. Uh, and it's like very Like what would be limited. an example? Like uh, So jih jihad is always discussed, jih okay. right? Jihad is discussed. Funeral rites are discussed some yes. degree, right? But when you're talking about, when you get to like Imam Ghazali and all, now they're saying, oh, well, it's a fard kifaya that someone needs to know carpentry in a town. I see. It's a okay, fard kifaya okay. that someone needs yeah. to know alchemy mm. in a town. Right? They're just, and they're expanding it. And then by the time you get to Zarkeshi, mm -hmm. which is like even later than the period that I'm looking at. Yeah. Um, he's now theorizing all of it as a doctrine, right? As he's sort of looking at it. So you, as you're sort of getting it in a lot of fiqh literature. Yeah. And then eventually it starts making its way into usul literature, and now it's being theorized at a, at a higher level. Okay. And so, <clears throat> and not that there wasn't theorizing going on before that as well by Ghazali, Mawardi, others, but they're sort of, what, what happens in this period is whereas Imam Shafi talks about these things, but in kind of sparse ways, um, it, it sort of expands after him, right? And it, it just continues to grow the level of detail. And and look, there the level of detail in legal doctrine was growing anyway, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but sure. my sense is that there's something else at play here and that it is, the way they're doing it, they're trying to create political and social cohesion. cohesion. That's a great um, hypothesis. And, yeah. and so that's sort of what I'm hoping to at least show or, and then get smashed. So on. define yeah. define social and political cohesion. Like, what does it look at the end? What is the vision? Well, so I and and whether they're successful or not right. is yeah. a separate discussion. But the vision. What's the, the vision? But I think jurists. in the mindsets, look yeah. for the jurists. They're thinking, man, the Khalifa, like, is this focal point for our kind of Islamic society vision, whatever civilization, because the Khalifa is essentially. In, in some respects, in place of where the Prophet, peace be upon him, was, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not anywhere <laughs> near, but it's at least that one role of like political Politically, authority, yeah. like guiding, and is and the Khalifa is completely kind of going, you know, becoming irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And so you see them start creating certain obligations mm -hmm. with regard to the Khalifa with, and, and certain roles of the Khalifa, who, mm -hmm. you know, they refer to as Imam, within these different collective duties, that he's going to have the right to lead the janazah or mm -hmm. re have to do certain things like this, right? So 
in one sense, they're, they're envisioning, hey, we need to have the warrior caliph, the one who's on the front lines. They're, they're sort of envisioning that type of Khalifa returning that used to exist in, you know, the Umayyad and early Abbasid period, but has gotten lost, right? Then there's thinking, okay, socially, man, like what ends up happening in this period is, you know, for a long time, Muslim society and a Muslim sort of uh, rule was primarily over non-Muslims, right? Like Muslims made up a small portion of Correct. Muslim society or, or areas governed by Muslims. But then you start having in this period... You had like minority that, rule. Minority right? rule, right? Mm -hmm. You start having massive conversion. Yeah. People are becoming Muslim. And people who are becoming Muslim who are not Arab, right? They're coming from different parts, different cultures, different rituals, and they're all coming into this sort of now, this collective, they all now have a stake in the destiny of Islam. So what do we do, right? There's a real sense that you could have sort of tensions, mm -hmm. friction with diversity, because you've got a whole bunch of new stakeholders who all have some, they want to have a say or something, right? And so what do you do? I think you end up creating linkages between people by creating duties that they owe to each other. And in the process of doing that, you're also sort of explaining and expanding on certain sort of rites and rituals that now you're going to collectively share. So duties to the dead are a prime example, yeah. right? What you're going to now do is wherever you go in the Muslim world, Right? If you're Muslim, you have duties that are owed to you when you die. And they're going to be performed the same way wherever you are, whatever culture you're in. Right? In terms, they're, they're going to have distinctions, but you're going to get these main type of things that are parts of the duty that are owed to you. You're going to be washed. You're going to be shrouded. You're going to have janazah said over you. All these things. Right? Right. You're going to be buried. And so part of that, I think the vision for them is to create kind of unity among these very diverse populations. Does, does it all, like when you gave the example of like um, a carpenter or mm -hmm. a alchemist or whatever, does it also take maybe the secular and Islamicize it in a way? Essentially bring back the importance of religion in things that are kind of become, maybe becoming out of the realm of religion. So for example, in yeah. modern society, you could do something like become an engineer, but your intent is to feel, do something in a religious way of Farth Kafaya. So yeah. now, now the intent becomes spiritual, and it almost brings back religion into the fold of a more of a more secular modern world, right? Uh, to some degree, and and here I'll plug Dr. Jackson's new book that's coming out in October called The Islamic Secular, mm -hmm. which really gets into this topic in in, in important ways. Um, I think we have to understand that that division just doesn't exist historically, right, in terms of the religious and the secular. Like, mm -hmm. people are just not thinking about the world in that way, right? We may frame something as secular, but for for people at that time, like, all of these things are connected, right, uh, in the sense that they're religious people. They're people who think about these a, a organically as part of their life. And that, in pre-modern societies, that's kind of the the norm, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think when, when you're talking about alchemy, when you're talking about sort of these things as Farth Kifaya, part of it is just understanding that you there are duties that are necessary for people to perform. And one of those duties is acquiring certain knowledge that are necessary for the well-being of the community. The community. Right. Now, we can understand that in secular ways, but for people back then... All of that is a moral question, right? Like all of that is a religious, like you have duties that you owe for the well-being of society. Like you have a responsibility and that's a moral responsibility that you have with regard to the well-being of society. So you're going to hmm. find somebody to perform those actions, right? So whether that's carpentry, alchemy, whatever else, right? Those are kind of not necessarily universally agreed upon examples, but Ghazali and I'll bring them up. But you have, like, I mean, as it relates to funeral rites, as it relates to in the context of jihad, all these things, right, that even in questions of, like, where you're sort of, uh, jurists will bring up the question of whether if 
uh, you have performed the Fart Kifaya and you've sort of, you know, helped in some town that's needed sort of support with regard to jihad. Like, well, then the Khalifa says we want to pursue into the enemy territory. Now, what are your responsibilities mm -hmm. there? What's your moral obligation there? And they go through discussions as to, you know, because they're now balancing out. Because yeah. the other thing that the book is kind of looking into is this constant tussle between the pragmatic and the sacred. And mm -hmm. you're trying to kind of figure out, jurists are always keeping both in mind. Because in my view, and, and this is sort of, I don't know how this lands, but um, Islamic law is both religious law and the law of empire, right? It's both those things. And that is, you read fiqh books and that's what's present, right? And you have to bear that in mind at times where, like, sometimes we get confused where we start trying to think we're going to apply the law of empire in the modern period. Right. And we run into all types of issues when we do that. Well, because I, before you mentioned this last point, I couldn't help but think that, you know, I think that the struggle for the Muslim imagination of Islamic law in the modern world is this tension between powers or, yeah, powers exercised by the state. Mm -hmm. And so much of that has been subsumed by uh, the duties owed to the state vis-a-vis -vis citizenship. Right. As being citizens of a nation state. Right. All of these or many of these things are absent in the pre-modern world. And are, and are absent in, I think, in the context that you're talking about, in the historical period you're talking about, where in, um, and, and because of that absence, how do you create that kind of cohesion? Right. In the modern sense, that gets created right. because of, by virtue of citizenship to the nation state. Right. And to some degree, you are sort of, as Muslim identity and the notion of like yeah. being Muslim people are embracing that it's you embrace it more and more as you sort of have duties that you're owed owing to other people and duties that are sure. owed to you. Right. Sure. Um, but this is an interesting thing as well with regard to the nation state. Mm -hmm. Part of the challenge, I think that many Muslim states and then Muslim communities and Muslim individuals face is from the standpoint of Muslim states, they want to be republics. You can't have it both. Like it, <laughs> but they're trying to implement it's like a, empire, yeah, empire, right? And so they want and, it, and the, they want their cake and to eat it. Yeah, too. but it's not even it's it's beyond that. It's like they don't understand. Like the when you're talking about empires, like you're talking ruler ruled, a totally different paradigm, and you want to take that and apply it to republics of equal citizenship, and then and then you want to call them Islamic republics, and privilege, sort of Islamic citizens over non-Muslim citizens, right? Muslim citizens over non-Muslim citizens, which is kind of what Gandhi is, talks about in a lot of stuff. It's like, it creates this contradiction and then that has all types of repercussions, right? Because you create second-class citizenship, etc. Then, for Muslim individuals, we essentially have masajids, imams, that function like mini khalifas, right? They're basically, nope. everyone has their little mini caliphate. Fiefdom, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, and they're, they're trying to think about implementing Islamic law, state level Islamic law in their little masjid. Like and you touched on this. And, or... and look, and, and part of that is even historically, yeah. like we never, there was never a notion that you were going to have khutbas that were not by people who were sort of representatives of the Khalifa. Of the state. Yep. Of the state, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're in a situation where you're basically telling people, so you're using, and, and so, and then there's, you know, support from Islamic law that says, hey, look, like you can't miss multiple khutbas, right? Um, and because part of that was like, it's your duty, you're, you're like there, you have to hear what like the state of affairs are, the Khalifa, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, like it's twisted up. And it's like, hey, if you don't hear, you know, Uncle Naeem yeah. give his khutbah on Friday for two Fridays in a row, you're in big trouble. You're nifak or something. Yeah, 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 but like, yeah, yeah. But that's, that's absurd. <laughs> you're right? applying I mean, like, a standard. Yeah, you're applying a totally different 
law that existed, rules that existed with regard to a different context, and now you're applying them here, mm -hmm. and and you're putting them in uh, such that now you go, you go to Pakistan, you've got like now you got to go, you know, you've got sort of the Diobandi uh, Caliphate, the Brailvi Caliphate, like everybody's got their little khilafas, mm -hmm. and and that so there's a lot of challenges that exist out of that as well, mm, uh, mm, which mm. we haven't we haven't fully processed because part of it is we don't want to let go of some of those. We want all of that to apply. And we've got to understand not everything applies anymore outside of sort of, you know, a, a state context. Jihad is a similar thing as well, right? I mean, like, jihad is, it, it's, it's so wild to me because you you know you had jihad on the frontiers that were kind of independent of the central state even back in the pre-modern time but they were not sort of without any boundaries without any kind of accountability to the center right because fundamentally islam islamic law is very injurious very concerned about fitna right so violence that is sanctioned by islamic law in the context of criminal law, in the context of warfare, is state regulated. That's right. Like the imam is essential for that, right? But now we've got states which are like, you know, okay, like, yeah, like you want to do jihad, like non-state actors, go ahead. Like you want to go from Pakistan into Afghanistan, go ahead. Like, no, like that is technically the responsibility of your army that you've set up. They are the ones who have authority in that space. It's state prerogative. It's yeah. state prerogative. It's yeah. just like we wouldn't imagine yeah. being like, oh, yeah. you want to carry out Hadood punishments in your masjid? Cool. That, that's like unheard of in the pre-modern period, right? Without some kind of state authority, local, some governing authority having oversight over that. Because yeah. it's the, it's the uh, potential for a lot of fitna. We, we, we've covered so much ground, you know, Adnan, uh, and I'm trying to think of a way that where we can also sort of begin to sort of wrap up here. I know that one of the other ways in which when you first come on my radar is because of your interest and the work you did with Javed Ramdi Saab, someone mm -hmm. who I've listened to online and someone who I've appreciated his approach to a lot of the issues that we've already sort of touched on vis-a-vis -vis your research and the work you do. So if you could maybe tell us, tell our listeners, one, maybe a little bit about Javed Ramdi Saab, sure. who people may not be familiar with because, I mean, his yeah. he primarily speaks in Urdu. And number two, kind of your work with him and how that dovetails into the research you're doing right now and what we were just some of the issues that we've just been grappling with. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the issues that we sort of were grappling with are really these questions around the relationship of Islamic law and the state, of historically how we conceived of Islamic law and its relationship to the governing entity, empire, so the law of empire, and then the kind of you know, the trend that we have to apply that law of empire in these republics that we now have formed, and the tensions, the frictions, the contradictions that all that creates, right? And, and look, some of this is a product of kind of a post-colonial need to recapture this sort of this time period of mm -hmm. like uh, greatness or whatever else you want to call it. There's a post-colonial need to sort of affirm identity, and so yeah. you you see that in the application of criminal law sure. without kind of you know without the context, the the procedural limitations, etc., that existed in the past. So I don't want to get into all that because uh, we. I mean, it's very fascinating, and, and I, I'm, I've written a little bit on it in some articles, so folks are happy to look at that. And Intisar Rub has a great book on doubt in Islamic law that touches on mm. some of these things mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to criminal law. But with regard to Javed Ahmed Ghamdi, he is uh, an Islamic scholar, Islamic intellectual as well, uh, or, or Muslim intellectual, but uh, Islamic scholar, uh, sort of trained traditionally or 
learned traditionally growing up, uh, did Darse Nizami, all these things with kind of teachers as a young child, uh, and then eventually sort of ends up being associated with Molana Maududi, with Jamaat e Islami for a number of years, and, and sort of uh, learning with Maududi Saab, and then his sort of uh, ultimate and main teacher ends up being Amin Asin Islahi, who is a major uh, commentator of the Quran in the Pakistan, in the Indian subcontinent, uh, and uh, and sort of writes this major uh, nine volume tafsir, nine or twelve volume tafsir of uh, called Tadabari Quran, and so. That's kind of Ramdi's intellectual history. He Ramdi comes on the scene. Ramdi Sab comes on the scene, really sort of to the public eye. For me, I had kind of connected with him back in '97. Oh wow! Um, and it was I was going through kind of some major questions as it related to Islam. It mainly sort of had been exposed to folks who were coming with a, a pretty kind of narrow perspective on things and and I didn't quite know how to address some of these major questions uh, and so I was randomly told my dad had said oh you know we were visiting Pakistan and he was like go listen to this uh, Islamic scholar your grandfather used to listen to him I've listened to him as well and like but you should go he, he'll help and I was my response was like I don't think a Pakistani mullah is going to help me in this moment like I'm in yeah. a serious existential crisis here but it, it was transformative you know I like went to his dars and he speaks you know in Urdu it's really pretty high level Urdu and I probably in that session understood 30% but it, he is it so good and he was so intelligent and smart. And then, you know, sort of built a relationship uh, and, and studied in with him and his students for some periods of time and have continued to kind of been interested in working on some of his thought. And so what I, how this connects to our conversation is that in 2015 or so, I think it was around 2015, it might have been prior, Ramdi Saab ends up writing a article uh, and, and publishes it in a major Urdu newspaper with an English translation that someone does in a major English newspaper in Pakistan called uh, Islam and the State, a counter-narrative. Mm. And it basically is a 10-point critique of the way in which we think about Islam and the state. Okay. And he brings up these ideas of like, you know, sort of, for instance, he, he critiques the notion of how can you have an Islamic republic and then not expect to have a kind of second-class citizenship for your Christian citizens, right? How are you going to have, like, you know, the sort of objectives uh, resolution or these, like, clauses with regard to Sharia, et cetera, when you also have, like, a population that is non-Muslim? Like, and so he he sort of brings and highlights this idea and it, he in, in these 10 points and then elaborates on them through a series of lectures. They're available on YouTube. They're all in Urdu on the idea of Islam and the state. And then I spent the last year or so taking the ideas in those lectures from Urdu and putting them into mm -hmm. English. So I basically give, not the same lecture, but I talk about his ideas in basically, I think it's about a series of 20 uh, lectures about... Because is he critiquing mm -hmm. only Pakistan or is he not... He's con he, no, he's making a critique of the traditional narrative okay, I of how we yeah. understand uh -huh. uh, and how traditionally these ideas around sort of Islam and the state were understood. And he elaborates on many different points, right? He, mm -hmm. he talks about... He, touches into issues of how, how apostasy is talked about, how kufr is talked about, and, and then just gets into, and he speaks about kind of these major representatives of the tradition in his view, right? He says there are certain folks who are like fuqaha, we know them, they're theologians, but then there are others who kind of transcend those categories and are major thinkers with regard to the Islamic vision, right? Mm -hmm. And for him, that is Ghazali, Ibn Taymiyyah, Shah Waliullah, and Maududi. Mm -hmm. And each represents a different branch within kind of this Islamic vision that is being Put out, you know, Maududi, kind of the political right. Shavuliola is kind of trying to balance between Ibn Taymiyyah and Ghazali, Ghazali, the Sufi type of approach, and Ibn Taymiyyah, kind of that response to it. But he says these are kind of, if you will, field defining people within 
Islamic studies. And so he says, you know, they have each different approaches, but they coalesce around this traditional narrative as it relates to Islam and the state. And he breaks that down in the initial lectures, sort of what that is. Mm -hmm. And then he spends the rest of the time kind of critiquing it where he feels, uh, you know, there, there are some Right. Major issues now with regards to the way how you are then mm. translating those ideas into because mm. uh, you're obviously speaking and you know grappling with these issues within an American context I would imagine right, right. so Muslims as a minority you know a group living in a secular democracy right so how do you see some of those issues play out yeah I mean I think and look you know without delving into too much stuff that's happening right now but I think one of the things that Muslims have to realize is that when you are living in a secular democracy. Just so we're not yes. too vague, and, and, yeah. and I think we can also kind of situate us where we mm. are in time and place, is mm. we're recording in June, you know, mm. certainly Pride Month and all mm. of that, all what that entails. But at the backdrop of all of this, a recent document dropped, which mm. uh, has a lot of sort of signatories that you and I both know, and we won't have time to maybe delve into all of that, but I think, you know, that's sort of what you're alluding to. Yeah. And I'm I, speaking of the Navigating Differences right. document that dro has dropped for a few weeks right. now. And I think, look, you know, so leaving even the document aside, although there, you know, it's, it's an interesting document. I have some critiques of it. There's some very interesting critiques that others have written, which people should read and, and sort of get a full kind of understanding of it. I think generally speaking, though, part of the challenge that we keep running into as Muslims is that we are at once asserting our Muslim identity as one of the identities within this kind of pantheon of identities in a secular democracy that deserves protection, that shouldn't be discriminated against, that has particular rights, etc. Like that's the language we're speaking. We've been pushing for the last like two decades in particular, you know, like that's where, that's the world we've been living in. And then you know, we run into spaces where, okay, there are other communities who we feel for, you know, some uh, segments of the Muslim community feel like are potentially their assertion of their identity is somehow going to do harm to us and our religious religiosity or whatever else. And so, but then our framing, we're trying to do it in a way where we're like, well, okay, like, Certain people were making those arguments about us, you know, before, and we're going to say, you know what, like, that's discriminatory, you need to check them. But now we are kind of in the place of doing the same. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that it, what I would want Muslims to do is like, I think you have to elevate the discourse a little bit, there has to be a level of sophistication, which I, you know, I'm sorry to say it's sometimes absent in the articulation of the conservative or more conservative opinion. And that's not just a Muslim community thing, to be honest. <clears throat> the conservative movement in general has really fallen into this trap. And and the 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 thing that I worry about is that it is now become there's multiple incidents, and I would say the statement is one of them, which seem to be repackaged conservative right-wing kind of Christian or even, you know, conservative political, uh, really conservative political right. uh, talking points that are just repackaged with kind of an Islamic frame or being repackaged or being said by an Islamic speaker. And we've had <clears throat> incidents where this has happened. Right. Multiple now. And I worry about that because we really need to be engaging in sort of sophisticated intellectual thinking through our tradition about these issues, through our frameworks. And part of this ties back to what I'm saying as well in terms of kind of reassessing and shaking up the frameworks within which we think, right? right? So duties, rights, etc. Here, I think what we end up oftentimes doing is just what I consider sometimes laziness, right? Where it's like, we're just adopting some other framework, throwing in some Islamic you know, uh, proof text, and then it's right. boom. And you know what? The, 
like I know this in terms of this type of approach because I when I work on helping countries draft their criminal codes or analyzing countries' criminal codes where they've tried to Islamicize it, part of the challenge that ends up happening is they just kind of lump and throw some stuff in to show that it's Islamic, but they haven't thought through it fully. And then the repercussions of it are quite severe, right? Mm -hmm. And you see that in Pakistan with the Hudud Ordinance, for instance, where you had like one of the major issues there was like this kind of confusion between consensual and non-consensual uh, sexual intercourse, where rape was ending up getting the same, you had to have the same evidentiary uh, sort of proof and requirements for rape as you did for zina and they're different categories right uh because of this notion of consent in the there so that's what i would say is like part of what i my hope for the muslim community in america is that we we seek to sort of elevate our discourse that we look within sort of frameworks that we may have within our tradition or paradigms and then use that to maybe articulate a more sophisticated way to understand whatever you know issues, social issues that uh, we might want to comment on. And and again, I'm not taking a stance here either way on this, but I'm just like I've just felt like the discourse has to be you know at a different level because what ends up happening is that when you don't do that, when the discourse ends up being something that is maybe not done or as kind of well thought out as it should be. And it's it's using kind of catchphrases here and there, which some, some don't even make sense. But you then squeeze out and narrow the space in which you can be conservative as a Muslim or whatever else in uh, the American United, landscape. United States. Yeah. yeah. And that, that, that I think goes against, you know, whatever sort of some of these folks who signed on uh, to this statement uh, would want. Um, you know, and this is let alone sort of, I'm not even commenting here on how we need to think through these issues because that then gets to, I think, an earlier point I said right. where part of what we need to do is have an organic understanding of Islam and help our young people navigate this society in a way which is not just, hey, stick your head in the sand or just be kind of in your little enclaves. Because that's that's not going to be the world that they're actually in in the long run. Right. And then you're going to throw them in and they just, they they don't quite know how to deal with, you know, what does it mean living in a secular democracy? What does it mean having different people who, you know, okay, maybe you don't agree with the lifestyle here or this or that, but like, how do you engage folks? How do you sort of have that uh, without it becoming kind of a Armageddon scenario? Of right. Sort? So anyway, I, I probably said too much on this already, but that's no, no. kind of where I would... I, no, it, I think it is, a, a, you know, it, it is complicated. And, I, and I, I, all I would posit here is that, you know, uh, one, one of my reasons for at least wanting to uh, touch on it, but without delving into it, I think, you know, to any great extent is to give the idea or at least leave the impression that it's not that one, you know, even though you can present a normative position on mm. XYZ issue, right. that's the easy part. Right. The, the more difficulty is how do you then translate that normative position that Islam mm -hmm. has vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular issue how do you communicate that and articulate that within an Amer you know within our context living as a minority community in America where we feel at times challenged and threatened and our way of life threatened and so on or or the or the moral compass with which we want to imprint on our children questioned and challenged how do you communicate that and articulate that within a framework that at the same time does fidelity to the tradition but it also recognizes the fact that there may be a plurality, that there may be, you know. Yeah, right. and, and part of that is also like, we can't see threats around every corner, right? <laughs> well, that like, happens it's when like, you are in a siege sort of mentality. Right, you the, do see threats around every But part of corner. that is, how much of that siege is one that you've taken on, That's right. on your own? Right. Like, 
when I'm engaging young people, they're not under siege. They're not. Right? I mean, like, they're figuring this stuff out because they have to, right? right. And they're, they're balancing and maybe their sort of way of doing Islam doesn't look like, you know, our generations, but they're still doing Islam. Like, they're still conservative. They're still praying, etc. But, you know, they're they're accepting of folks in a way which they have organically figured out how to be the conservative Muslim and also be accepting of like friends and other people who, you know, may not have their lifestyle. And guess what? Yeah. We all did that we when we did, did that, that as well. Thank you. Right. We were doing that as well. Right. And so it's, so that's where I'm thinking like the, the notion that there is, I think what troubles me is that this idea that there's some existential, like, existential threat. moment and yeah. threat and yeah. like, and that as a result, we have to like align with, you know, a particular type of demagoguery that's happening, like in American society, I, it does, we have to be very careful. And I think, you know, some people have pointed that out as to, you know, whereas the statement could have been, I think, maybe a theological statement it ends up, it starts off as a political and, and right. kind of stays with that. Yeah. But, you know, again, I don't want to, I don't, yeah. there's a lot to unpack there. There is, there but is. But I, what I fine. would just encourage, yeah. I think in general, and, and part of this, my experience in the Bay Area has been very interesting, and I've enjoyed sort of being out here, engaging the Muslim community out here as well. But but there is at times where I have, I can't lie that I've been a bit disappointed. I had expected hmm. the discourse to be a little more elevated. And what I've ended up finding is that there's a real celebrity imam culture here, which, okay, that's fine. I get it. Like, But I I, I would have hoped for, I think, something a little more elevated uh, given kind of the type of intellectual energy that's out here but there's something that seems to happen when it comes to islam religion that we just we don't want to think we just want like just give us the formula let's you know plug it in and that's it i think we as a american muslim community let alone uh islamic society as a whole uh, we've got to think beyond that we, we need to think we have to really be at the forefront of thinking through a lot of these things um, so, at a different so level. I, I guess as we wrap then, I mean, are you thinking about these in any sort of forthcoming publication or something you're working on right now? You have already talked about your the book that you worked on while you were here during yeah, the Yeah, so I'm, in forthcoming, I'm going to, you know, hopefully wrap that up and uh, and get that out in the next uh, year or so. Okay. And then, uh, you know, there's some projects that I'm going to work on in terms of articles. Um, I, I have an interest in, you know, moving forward. There's a book around Ghamdi that I would like to write. There's the book on Islam in Philadelphia that I hope to write. And then I'm, I'm very interested in, you know, I wrote a piece a little while ago on the immorality of incarceration. Um, and it was looking at an article that Gandhi Saab had written back in the late 80s. But what it sparked for me, and it was a critique of prisons from a moral standpoint. Mm. And I discovered a bunch of other Muslim scholars who'd been doing that. And what it sparked for me was this idea like, oh, I want to investigate like the ways in which historically Muslim thinkers have provided moral critique for things that are happening, like the institution of prison. And that sort of idea of like how you use your tradition, how you use your sort of uh, this heritage that you have to provide sort of moral critiques on major sort of you, uh, social issues or major kind of whether it's climate change, whether it's pr that those are the things that I I'm hoping to investigate and kind of put forward and be like, hey, like I did in that context you know what, like we've critiqued mass incarceration here in the U.S. and we do it in a particular paradigm and, and approach it from racial discrimination and all these things. Guess what? There are these other thinkers who are, who are critiquing it, the very institution outside of any context, yeah. outside of any context, the very institution, they're providing a moral critique. And here it is. And look at how fascinating it is. Yeah, so, uh, wow, covered a lot, and mm -hmm. thank you so much for the generous nature of, or the generosity of your time and, and the energy that you've sort of given 
uh, as we've taken almost two hours of your time. So uh, where can people, I guess, maybe reach out to you, engage you, check out yeah. some of your work and your writings? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, any any listener who sat through the whole thing, I, I thank you and your patience. And You'll I, be surprised. There's yeah. probably plenty. So. Yeah, and I thank your families as well who, who <laughs> let you do that. Um, yeah, for, for my stuff, you know, I have um, – my work is available online either through – Rutgers Law's website where um, my bio will be there, or if you're on SSRN or academia.edu or research.edu, if you just type my name in and articles by, it it should all pop up. Um, I don't have a website yet, although some of my colleagues have, and they've kind of encourage me, but at some point I'll have to figure out how to do all that. But yeah, um, but yeah and uh, let me just also plug, if you guys are ever interested in sort of supporting charitable work in, in Malawi. Uh, <clears throat> if you if your family wants to build a water well that'll uh, you know support hundreds of people, other things, go to banjaomodzi.com. Can you spell that out? Yeah. yeah. B A N J A U M O D Z I dot com. It means one family in Chichewa. Um so banjaomodzi.com and um you know you can find information there etc but that works ongoing and it's um uh it's probably the stuff that i care about the most so and i would imagine i mean a contribution could also be zakat eligible i mean oh yeah absolutely and and we um it was got eligible and and we also we work with other ngos there and and we 100 percent of the donations go to uh the recipient we don't take any administrative or any other um, Excellent. I love I love the fact you have all these theoretical ideas, but <laughs> yeah. then you back it up with some really yeah. good uh, practical uh, work on the ground. So, and I've and I've loved this time with you. It's been it's been great. You're just really interesting to spend time with. Yeah, and I appreciate. Yeah. It. I wish we had more time with you while you were out here. I mean, it was our. I, I was remiss not to connect earlier, but I'm glad we were, and we were very fortunate to have you on the show. But but because you're leaving the barrier, yeah. it doesn't mean that we can't have you back on the show virtual recording, or if you ever come back and visit. And well, I, I might have to come out to Philly. There you go. Oh, you, Please the way, do. The way yeah, you we'll, it. We'll, we'll, we'll take you to get some halal cheesesteaks, <laughs> um, real halal cheesesteaks. That's right. But, I just uh, want but, to meet the, the lady, uh, the guy at Walmart, and get a salam. Oh, yeah. And and by the way, there's uh, Philly, the Masjid Kuba that I'm writing on, yeah. the first African-American Hafiz al-Quran in the United States in the modern period. If you leave out kind of period of slavery and and, and the enslaved, this was uh, Anwar Muhammad uh, is, uh, many people believe he's the first wonderful human being. Uh, so if you ever get him on your show, you should definitely do that too. Um, but yeah, thank you all. And, and I do, I, I have loved my time here and I hope I plan to come back at least once a year and, Shalom, and find great. excuses to come. Yeah. So I'd love to connect with you brothers at some point as well. Oh, we would love that. Thank you so much. And uh, so as always, uh, thank you listeners for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, thoughts, feedback, you can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Hit us up on various social media out outlets. Please share. Please contribute. Um, please uh, help spread the word about the show and so that we can continue bringing guests like Adnan Zulfikar and others to the show. Catch us again on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Mm-hmm. <laughs>